two teenagers cautiously approach an old, decrepit house. The house looks like it was built hundreds of years ago, and from the outside, it appears to be in a serious state of disrepair. The walls are cracked and weathered, the roof looks to have holes in it, and one of the decorative columns has completely collapsed. The teenagers have heard rumors about this dilapidated home, though, and they have heard there are riches still to be found inside. One of the teens starts walking up the stairs onto the porch, but his friend seems reluctant to follow. Is he sure that no one lives here? The braver of the teens tells his friend that he's been watching the house for days and hasn't seen anyone come in or out. The only signs of life have been a very faint light visible between the cracks of the house's boarded up windows, and he's not even sure if he actually saw any lights or not. If there is anyone in there, it's just some crazy old person. They can easily scare them off and loot the house at their leisure. His friend still doesn't look sure, but the other teen proceeds to take out a lockpick. He tells his friend to keep a lookout while he works on the door. He doesn't need to keep watch for long, though, since the lock almost immediately opens with a loud click. He opens the door carefully, but it still squeaks loudly. Through the crack, he can't see much of anything inside. It looks very dark. Come on, he tells his friend as he slips inside. His friend looks nervous as he watches his friend disappear into the house. Suddenly, there's a loud crash. Oh no, we've been caught, he thinks as he spins around. But he doesn't see a police officer coming to arrest them or a nosy passerby. Instead, he watches as a cat chases a rat into some trash cans, knocking more of them over. He breathes a sigh of relief as he watches the cat come out of the pile of trash, holding its prey limply by the tail. He turns to follow his friend into the house, but is stopped when the door snaps shut in his face. He tries the doorknob, but it's locked. He taps quietly on the door. No response. He taps a little louder, whispering, Hey, what's going on? But still no response. What is going on? Inside, his friend is also pulling on the doorknob, but it's no use. The door won't budge, and the lock won't turn. He also tries tapping lightly on the door, but there's no signs from outside that anyone has heard him. He's trapped. He looks around the darkened room. Just like the outside, the interior looks like it hasn't been updated in hundreds of years. Dust and cobwebs are everywhere, like no one has set foot inside in decades. And yet, on several small tables and shelves around the room, are lit candles. With no other option, he decides to move deeper into the house. He creeps into the next room, which is in much the same condition as the first, dusty and old, but with several candles placed around that give off just the faintest amount of flickering yellow light. Not only does someone still live here, but they've lit these candles recently. He takes a folding knife out of his pocket and opens it, holding the blade out in front of him. Just then, he hears something, a noise like footsteps, and it sounds like it's coming from upstairs in the room right above him. They might be coming down to look for him. He needs a place to hide. He spots a sofa near the corner and tries to get down behind it as much as possible. As he grips the edge of the sofa with one hand, he suddenly drops his knife to the floor and uses his now free hand to stifle a scream. He looks at the hand that was just gripping the sofa and sees a long sewing needle plunge deep into his hand. Was this stuck into the couch? He pulls the needle out of his hand. It nearly went all the way through and holds the bloody wound up to his mouth, trying to stop the flow of blood as he waits and listens. The sound of footsteps finally stop. Whoever is walking around, it doesn't sound like they're coming down the stairs to find him. He has to get out of this house, though. There must be another way out. He picks up his knife and quietly moves to the next room. Once again, it's in the same condition as the last. But wait, what's that in the corner? Is that a person lying there? Outside the house, his friend is looking through the same trash that he saw the cat hunting in. Aha! Just what he was looking for, an old wire hanger. He runs back to the old house, untwists it, and inserts the thin wire into the lock. Inside, the trespassing teen gets closer and closer to the thing in the corner. It's so dim, though, with the only light coming from the candles that he still can't make out what it is. But he feels strangely compelled to find out. He picks up one of the candles off of a nearby table. Outside, he still can't get the lock open, but he's got to keep trying. He can't leave his friend trapped inside. He's standing right over the thing in the corner now. He kneels down and brings the candle close to see what it is, and screams. His friend throws down the hanger in frustration before sitting down on the porch. He can't figure out why his friend was able to open the lock so easily, and now it won't move. Did something in the mechanism break? He doesn't know what he's going to do, though. Should he call for help? The police will arrest them both if he does. How long should he wait, though? 
It feels like his friend has been stuck for a long time, and he hasn't heard anything from inside. What could possibly be happening in there? Should he just leave and hope that his friend is able to escape on his own? Just as he is wondering what to do, he hears a click behind him. He turns around and tries the door handle, but it's still locked. He looks down and sees the wire hanger. Maybe he'll give it one more try. He sticks the hanger into the lock and hears the lock pop open almost instantly. He tries the door handle, and this time, the door swings open. He stands there looking through the cracked door into the dark house. He's terrified at the thought of going inside, but he can't leave his friend in there. If he's in trouble, then he has to save him. Gathering up all of his courage, he enters the house and sees the same thing his friend did, a dusty old room. He takes a step into the candlelit room and freezes. There's something in the middle of the room. It's a chair that's turned away from him, but he can see that someone is sitting in it. But wait, is that his friend? Hey, he calls in a loud whisper, but his friend doesn't respond. Come on, let's get out of here. Still no response. He starts walking toward his friend, but stops when he hears what sounds like footsteps coming from the room above him. He's got to get his friend and get out of this house. He checks over his shoulder to make sure the door is still open before starting to quietly move towards his friend again. He's close enough that he can reach out and shake his shoulder, but his friend doesn't react. He walks around to the front of the chair and sees his friend, except it's no longer his friend. Staring back at him are two empty eye sockets. His mouth has been pulled back by stitches of thread into a horrifying permanent grin, but worst of all is what he hears. It's the sound of the front door slamming shut. Привет! Today's file is a special one and comes from the Russian branch of the SCP Foundation. It's SCP-1098-RU, also known as the Theater of Living Puppets. SCP-1098-RU is a two-story house located in a small Russian city which appears to have been constructed in the Baroque style, which was popular in the 17th and 18th centuries and is characterized by its exuberant details. The house is likely several hundred years old and is in an advanced state of disrepair. The local government administration has marked the house for demolition multiple times, but for reasons that remain unknown, these plans are always scrapped or indefinitely delayed. All of the doors that lead into SCP-1098-RU are locked and the windows are all boarded up. Anyone who attempts to damage the house, even just by removing the boards from the windows, will experience an odd anomalous effect that compels them to instead protect the structure and cause it no harm. This effect only wears off when the subject moves at least 50 meters away from the house. The only way to enter SCP-1098-RU is through the front door, which even though it is locked, is easily able to be picked open which causes no harm to the house and prevents the anomalous effect from overcoming the subject trying to gain entrance. Once someone has entered the house, they will find that the door closes behind them and locks itself. The lock cannot then be picked open again for one hour. The interior of the house matches the exterior stylistically, also appearing to have been designed in the Baroque style and in a poor condition. The house is quite dark since there are no electric lights present and all of the windows are boarded up, blocking any outside light. The only illumination comes from the lit candles that are placed around the house, which appear to be constantly replaced and lit again when they burn out. The sound of slow footsteps can be heard inside the house, though the room they are coming from seems to change. The entity producing the sounds has been classified as SCP-1098-RU-1, and it is thought that it is also responsible for the placing and relighting of candles around the house, as well as several other anomalous effects. The Russian branch of the SCP Foundation first became aware of potential anomalous activity related to SCP-1098-RU after the disappearance of multiple teenagers was linked to the location. In interviews, many of their friends and family reported that their last known locations were near the site of the old Baroque-style home, and several had expressed a desire to investigate the house before they disappeared. Local police investigated the house, which only led to them disappearing as well. After learning of the strange activity connected to the house, the Foundation took over the investigation planting a cover story that totalitarian sects were responsible for the disappearances, while Class A amnestics were administered to all relatives of the missing teens. The Foundation immediately began investigating the house, but carefully, since they had already seen how easily people could go missing inside. In the first excursion into the house, a remotely controlled robot fitted with a camera was sent inside. 
just like when a person enters, the door closed and locked behind the robot. But its camera feed continued to broadcast images to the researchers outside. As the robot explored the rundown house's rooms, it found something much more disturbing than just lit candles. In several of the rooms, corpses were discovered, which were later identified as being some of the missing teenagers. All of the bodies found had their eyeballs removed, and thick threads had been sewn into their arms and legs, as if they had been turned into giant living puppets. Some of them also had stitches in their chest and face areas. The face stitches appear to have been made to force the face to have a certain expression, while the chest stitches may indicate that organs had been removed. No signs of decomposition were present though, despite some of the bodies likely being many months old. Several objects were also found next to the bodies, including surgical knives, needles, thread, and at least one artificial eye. Exactly one hour after the robot entered the house, the camera ceased broadcasting images and all contact was lost. For the second excursion into the house, the Foundation decided that a human being would be more effective at gathering information than a robot. A Class D personnel was given a flashlight, a camera, and a radio, and sent on a mission to attempt to remove objects from the house and to locate the robot from the first research mission. The D-Class entered the house, and researchers noted that from what they could see on the video feed, that the layout of the house hadn't changed. Candles were still present around the room, though it was clear that they had been replaced by fresh ones. As the D-Class explored the first floor of the house, he reported that he could hear footsteps coming from different parts of the house, and on one occasion, that they sounded like they were coming from a room he had just left. But when he returned to that room, no one was present. He wasn't able to locate the missing robot, but did find the same corpses that the robot had. He was ordered by the researchers to pick up one of the surgical knives and try bringing it out of the house, but the moment he picked it up, all contact was lost. A third mission into the house was then tried, this time with another remotely controlled robot, though this one was more advanced and equipped with a thermal imager and audio recording equipment. This robot was also better suited for exploration and was capable of climbing stairs so that the Foundation could finally find out what was on the second floor of this strange house. The robot entered the home and ascended to the second floor. As it explored the rooms, it found one particularly strange one that appeared to be operating as a kind of sewing workshop, with huge amounts of thread, needles, and other sewing supplies spread across multiple tables. Dark red stains covered many of the tables, but no bodies were discovered in the sewing room. The robot continued to explore the second floor though, and soon discovered many more corpses, accounting for nearly all of the missing teenagers, the police that had vanished, as well as the missing D-Class personnel. All of them had been dressed in 18th century style clothing, and their eyes had been removed and replaced with artificial ones, giving them a perpetual glassy-eyed stare. Long thick threads had been sewn into their arms and legs as well. The sound recording equipment on the robot captured the same sounds of footsteps that the D-Class had reported, but the thermal imager didn't locate any signs of life. The researchers decided to call an end to the experiment and began guiding the robot back out of the house, but just as it reached the front door, the connection was lost, and the robot has never been located. One final expedition into the home was approved, this time using another D-Class personnel whose mission was to explore the entire house, including the second floor, before attempting to leave the home. The D-Class entered the home as normal, but immediately reported feeling a strange feeling that the other D-Class hadn't mentioned. He told the researchers listening that he was experiencing an intense headache and pressure in his ears, and that he could hear what sounded like someone crying in another room. None of the equipment picked up the crying sounds, and the D-Class was ordered to investigate further. He approached the room that he claimed the sound was coming from, but still nothing was detected on the audio recording equipment. He was ordered to enter the room, and though he seemed scared and reluctant, eventually he did so. Once inside, he reported seeing a young girl wearing an 18th century style dress. The girl was dancing, but crying as she did so. Just like on the corpses that had previously been found inside the house, threads were connected to her arms and legs, but these ones were pulled tight and stretched up towards the ceiling. The D-Class followed their path up but they disappeared into the darkness, reporting that it looked like there was no ceiling at all, just an inky black void where something was manipulating the strings attached to the girl, forcing her to dance. None of these visuals reported by the Class D could be seen on the video feeds the researchers were watching. As far as they could see, he was staring into an empty room. The D-Class was ordered to continue watching this strange recital though, and after five minutes, all of the communication devices ceased working. 
The video feed was lost too, but the audio continued to record for a few more seconds, during which time a sharp clap noise was heard. The D-Class began screaming as a deep male voice spoke a phrase in Latin, et perficiendi sit pretium. The performance must be paid for. No further signs of the D-Class were ever found. SCP-1098-RU has since been fenced off to prevent the general public from being able to enter it. A patrol team of four security guards is always on site, and anyone who attempts to gain entry to the house is to be detained, interrogated, and administered Class B amnestics. Additional research into SCP-1098-RU is ongoing, but requires approval from at least two members of the O5 Council, and to date, no further expeditions inside this anomaly, which has been given the object Class Euclid, have been authorized. It is still unknown who or what exactly the entity inside of SCP-1098-RU is, but it has been designated as SCP-1098-RU-1, and some in the Foundation have taken to calling it by a nickname, the Master of Puppets. A small convertible sports car rumbles down a desert road, kicking up a cloud of dust high into the air behind it. The driver is sharply dressed and looks at himself in the rearview mirror, giving his sunglasses a slight adjustment. He knows he looks as good as he feels. And why shouldn't the producer of Hollywood's ninth most successful film in the month of September be happy? The car comes to a sudden stop in front of a cluster of buildings, which appear to be the only structures in this vast, otherwise empty desert. The producer hops out of the car and surveys the desolate location. The cracked concrete airstrip, the weather-beaten buildings, the endless, lonely desert stretching on for miles in every direction. This place is great! The producer says out loud to no one in particular. The whole location would be perfect for his new movie, which is set entirely at a desert airstrip, and tells the story of a lonely airplane mechanic who falls in love with a female bounty hunter chasing an escaped convict, a tale as old as time. But now, where's the guy who called him? He kept rambling about wanting to make a documentary about the desert or something, but that doesn't matter now. He doesn't realize what a great filming location he's sitting on. The producer calls out, Hello? but the only response is the desert breeze. He takes off his sunglasses and looks around. He sees that the doors to the hangar are cracked. Maybe the guy who owns this place is in there. The producer walks inside the hangar, but abruptly stops. His mouth goes agape. He can't believe what he's seeing. This place is even better than the guy on the phone had described it. The hangar is huge and completely empty. He could probably build almost all the sets in the hangar, maybe even shoot the entire picture out here. He'd save a fortune on the budget by not having to pay the soundstage rates that the studios charge on the movie lots in LA. You beautiful genius, he thinks to himself. The movie could flop and still be a financial success. But where's the guy who called him? Doesn't he know who he is? He's a very important producer and doesn't have time to wait around for some desert nobody who runs a two-bit airport. All right, that's it. He's leaving. The producer turns to leave, but the doors of the hangar suddenly slide shut with a bang. Is this some kind of joke? He walks up to the hangar doors and starts banging on them, but they don't move. Hello? Hey, I'm trapped in here. What's the big deal? Still no response. Just what is going on at this place? The producer is getting worried. Was this some kind of a setup? Is he about to get robbed? It wouldn't be the worst thing in the world if they took his car. He's nine payments behind on it anyway. But geez, is it hot in here. It was hot outside, but it's even worse in this hangar. And whoever said that the desert air was dry? An idiot, that's who. The humidity in here is stifling. The producer loosens his collar and tugs at it, trying to cool off. All right, I've had just about enough. If you don't let me out of here, there's going to be a big problem for you, fella. Just then, the producer hears a noise behind him, coming from the dark deeper in the hangar. The producer doesn't react, though. He needs to play it cool. He bends down and pretends to tie his shoe, and takes the Derringer pistol out of his ankle holster. He stands up and spins around, pointing the gun in front of him, but he can't see anyone in the darkness. This is your last chance. I'm not playing around here. The strange noise comes again, a low rumbling noise, and the producer stumbles forward. What just happened? It felt like the floor rippled and pushed him forward. There, it happened again. And again, the producer screams. What's going on? The rumbling, growling noise grows louder as the floor keeps rippling and pushing him forward, like a wave rolling through the solid ground. Is this an earthquake? The producer is knocked off his feet, and still the floor keeps pushing him forward, towards where that horrible growling noise is coming from. He tries to stand, but he can't. The floor is moving too much. 
He tries to crawl, but keeps getting moved closer and closer to the source of the now deafening roar that seems to be coming from… What is that? The producer screams and fires his gun at the… thing in front of him. In the flashes of the gunfire, he can finally see it. The thing that he's being pushed into. A giant, gaping maw, filled with a mass of gnashing, grinding teeth. How unlucky for this movie producer that he didn't realize until it was too late that the location for his new movie would be the last one that he'd ever scout. Because as you have probably already figured out, this unknown building in the middle of the desert isn't at all what it appears to be. And in fact, is quite known to the SCP Foundation as SCP-1051. SCP-1051 isn't actually a building at all, but in fact, is a living organism. This creature's shell, which resembles an aircraft hangar, is quite large and measures roughly 700 meters by 500 meters by 60 meters. It is a completely immobile organism and acts as an ambush predator, luring its prey to it through a number of different forms of sociological and psychological manipulation. SCP-1051 attempts to bring prey to it in a number of ways, but its primary method is by spreading certain ideas into popular culture. It will constantly try to connect to orbiting satellites and use them to beam out television signals, images, and other forms of media. It has been measured as having around a 25% success rate in connecting with and getting its message carried by the satellites, and may have the ability to transmit regular radio broadcasts or connect to standard telephone lines as well. The messages that SCP-1051 sends out tend to fall into the category that could be termed as conspiracy theories, most of which are about itself. It has uploaded information to various conspiracy websites that has included reports of spaceships being held and reverse-engineered in its hangar, descriptions of so-called men in black using its location as a site for extraterrestrial contact. It has attempted to spread rumors that it is a site used as a testing location for any number of top-secret devices including energy weapons, weather control devices, teleportation machines, and impossible propulsion systems. SCP-1051 has also attempted to spread through radio and television transmissions that it is a site used by a United States shadow government. It's made at least a handful of calls to Hollywood-based production companies in an attempt to get them to further spread its information, as well as contacting various tabloid newspapers. Perhaps most nefarious of all, it has even sent orders to US military intelligence operatives posing as a senior official and ordering them to reveal SCP-1051's location. SCP-1051 appears desperate to make its location known to curious outsiders, all in an attempt to get them to come find it, so it can lure them inside of itself and feed. And the anatomical structure of SCP-1051 is perfectly suited to this task. Its bizarre biological structure consists of a large tongue, which looks very similar to a paved runway. The tongue leads directly into a set of large airplane hangar doors that could be called the organism's mouth. This door mouth opens up to what looks like a hangar, but is actually the gizzard-like organ of 1051, where it grinds its prey into a fine paste to prepare it for digestion. The next building is the creature's stomach, where it breaks down the liquefied prey into nutrients and separates the waste products that it can't digest. The nutrients are transported to the area where SCP-1051's brain is thought to reside, while the waste is ejected out of the structure. Finally, there are what appears to be a set of antenna on the side of the building. These information distribution organs extend below the ground as well, where many more antenna and wires are thought to exist, and give 1051 the ability to send out multiple television, radio, and other signals. SCP-1051 was discovered in 1947, when an egg-shaped structure was reported to have crash-landed in the desert of the American Southwest, near the town of Roswell, New Mexico. The United States Air Force took this strange egg into its possession and moved it to its current location in Nevada for observation and research. The Air Force scientists who were assigned to the object first thought that they were dealing with a meteorite, the one that was composed of some yet unknown material. They soon discovered that the object was hollow and was filled with some kind of liquid. Strangest of all, though, was when they detected something inside that liquid core. And it was moving. They studied the object for years, until one day, something happened that would end their research for good. The egg hatched. One night, as Air Force Sergeant Burnson and two scientists, Dr. James and Dr. Gold, were going about their regular work analyzing the object, they heard a strange sound. When they looked at the object, they saw that a crack had begun to form on the outer shell. This cracking continued for about five minutes, until something finally broke through the shell. 
an alien creature began to emerge from its shell, and the men all turned to run, but something reached out with a long tentacle-like arm and grabbed Dr. James. It pulled the scientist in and seemed to absorb him right into its body. Sergeant Bernson and Dr. Gold managed to escape the airplane hangar and send out a distress signal, and it was this cry for help that described an attack by an alien creature that would put the object firmly on the SCP Foundation's radar. As Sergeant Bernson was sending out the distress signal, Dr. Gold tapped him on the shoulder and pointed towards the hangar where the egg-like object had been stored. The two men watched as the hangar bulged and expanded like something was pressing against the walls from inside. The hangar suddenly collapsed, and they watched as the creature looked to writhe around in the debris. But then a new shell began to form around the alien. It grew larger, expanding and shifting until suddenly, it took on nearly the exact form as the hangar that once stood there. SCP Foundation agents arrived at the site not long after and took control of the area. They discovered almost immediately that the building-shaped creature was anything but dormant. This extraterrestrial that had been born from an egg and then taken the form of an airplane hangar was ejecting its own eggs. The building would occasionally blast eggs up and into the sky. Several of these eggs were stopped and reclaimed by the Foundation, but others managed to slip past and escape the Earth's atmosphere, making them impossible to recover. The Foundation also soon detected that radio signals were being emitted by the hangar, and set up a small radio nearby which would allow them to both receive and send signals back to the creature that was now designated as SCP-1051. Dr. Richardson, the Foundation researcher on site who was leading the investigation into 1051, found the frequency that it was transmitting on and attempted to speak to the creature. After asking if 1051 could hear it, the creature actually responded and it seemed to have a very simple request, give. When Dr. Richardson asked it to elaborate, asking, give what? 1051 responded, want feed, bring food. When the doctor told 1051 that it wouldn't be getting any food, the anomaly immediately sent out a new transmission, stating, Area 51 is currently being controlled by the SCP Foundation, a shadow government organization that has designated it SCP-1051, here are a few names of the operatives. Dr. Richardson cut SCP-1051 off and ordered a D-Class personnel to be sent inside the creature, hopefully appeasing it and stopping it from sending any more broadcasts out about the highly secretive organization. When asked why it was sending these signals, SCP-1051 responded that it was trying to make humans curious. It appeared that its hunting strategy was to flood the world with conspiracy theories, conspiracy theories about itself. This would then cause interested humans to come explore the location, and once they entered the hangar, their curiosity would reward them with an encounter with the alien that they had been seeking. SCP-1051 also explained that the eggs that it was ejecting were its babies, and it seemed quite upset that the Foundation had intercepted some of them as they were on their orbital escape trajectory. But where had SCP-1051 come up with these conspiracy theories? Had it been studying our culture and the boom of science fiction in the 1940s to make up stories it thought would lead people to it, Foundation researcher Dr. Richardson had a hunch that there was something else going on. He next spoke to Dr. Gold, the other Air Force scientist who had been studying the egg-shaped meteorite. He asked him to describe SCP-1051's first victim, Dr. James. Dr. Gold told him that Dr. James was obsessed with his job and that spread into his personal life. He was a real sci-fi nut. Dr. James apparently loved B-movies, especially ones about aliens and UFOs. He was convinced that the government had both in their possession already, and his research on the strange, egg-shaped meteorite only added to his confidence in that fact. Had SCP-1051 somehow absorbed this knowledge from its first meal here on Earth, and was now using it as a way to lure in new, inquisitive prey? Dr. Richardson thought it may go even deeper than that. When he played a recording of the first conversation he'd had with SCP-1051 for Dr. Gold, the one where 1051 told him it wanted him to bring food, Dr. Gold was left shocked. The voice he was hearing belonged to Dr. James. SCP-1051 remains in the Nevadan Desert, and its area is patrolled at all times by no less than 20 Foundation personnel in uniforms that resemble those worn by members of the United States Air Force. They are authorized to shoot at intruders, but not with the intention to kill, instead, only as a means to scare them away. Should any intruders come within one kilometer of SCP-1051, they are to be detained and administered Class A amnestics. 
Since SCP-1051's primary danger stems from its ability to spread false information, the SCP Foundation's main containment efforts have been focused on stopping its broadcasts. Agents are to respond to any civilian rumors or questions about SCP-1051 with denial and ridicule, to make it clear that these are nothing but stories and that the person is stupid for believing them. Should they exhibit any knowledge beyond the normal myths and rumors, the application of Class A amnestics is also permitted. Any satellites orbiting near 1051's location are to be monitored for interference to their transmissions, and if any antenna with an unknown purpose are discovered within a 10-kilometer area of the building, they are to be destroyed or surrounded by a Faraday cage. SCP-1051 may not be able to move, but its ability to reproduce and the difficulty that the Foundation still faces in stopping its spread of disinformation has led to it being classified as Euclid, and research into its origins and biology are ongoing. It's day 9 of Joseph Mann's expedition into the extreme wilderness of Antarctica. He's been following the tracks of a mysterious creature, a massive, anomalous beast that has been spotted in the snowy wastes. As he follows the tracks, he sees something. It's his own tent, but he had been walking for days after leaving this camp. How was he back here after only a few hours? Time and distance were starting to feel off, like they were stretched out and folded over into knots. Maybe he was confused about the tracks. Maybe he hadn't been chasing after something, but following the tracks of something that had been chasing him. Maybe he was wrong about everything. Hi, I'm Dr. Bob, and this is SCP-2764, also known as the Eldritch Antarctic. SCP-2764 is a massive biological entity standing over 380 meters tall and estimated to weigh over 150,000 metric tons. It possesses around 80 tentacle-like arms that it uses for movement and simple actions like grasping objects. It also has what looks to be a head with four eyes. SCP-2764 possesses a number of anomalous properties, including the ability to communicate telepathically with humans, though the language used changes based on the person who is receiving its messages. Strangely, this communication appears to go one way only, as it has never demonstrated that it understands any attempts to communicate back to it. Its physical state has also been observed to be quite anomalous. Its size does not follow normal Euclidean geometry, with the creature appearing many times larger or smaller than it should based on the viewer's distance from SCP-2764. There appears to be a critical zone lying roughly 50 kilometers away from the creature that stretches around it in a circle. As you move away from the creature and approach this line, SCP-2764 actually appears to grow larger until the critical zone is passed, at which point it begins to shrink as you move farther and farther away. Its body has a number of other strange properties too. Its tentacle-like arms rapidly translocate around its body at random intervals, jumping around all over its body creating a twitchy, writhing mass that makes it impossible to count how many tentacles it actually possesses. But perhaps strangest of all is that not only do the creature's arms seem to break the laws of physics by jumping around its body, but so too does the entirety of SCP-2764. It's been observed to spontaneously relocate itself to different places, as if it is flickering in and out of existence. It appears that the creature flickers into a new place like this at random intervals, but it may be following some yet unknown rules, as it has never been seen appearing more than 25 kilometers away from where it was last seen and always flickers back to its original location within 48 hours. SCP-2764 was first discovered by a civilian team that was conducting detailed surveys of the Antarctic landscape. The team observed the creature, and were immediately alarmed by its strange properties, especially its bizarre geometric qualities. They returned to their home base and described what they had seen to a colleague, who was actually an SCP Foundation researcher in charge of investigating anomalous activity in Antarctica. This researcher sent word back to his superiors, who activated Mobile Task Force Ada-5, also known as the Jaeger Bombers. Ada-5 administered amnestics to the survey team and any other exposed civilians before setting up a perimeter around SCP-2764. What they would eventually learn was that the perimeter they established was far too close. In his investigation logs, MTF-805 Commander Joseph Mann noted that he immediately experienced strange anomalous effects, such as how the creature seemed to shrink the closer he got to it, and the strange voices in his head. His curiosity soon got the better of him, 
and he decided to do some of his own research into the entity before the rest of the SCP Foundation scientists and guards arrived to take over the investigation. Mann gathered a couple volunteers who were also curious about the nature of the anomaly and set out on an expedition to gather more information. Just as they had experienced before, the more they walked towards the creature, the more it appeared to shrink in size. They also made note of strange prints in the snow. At first, they looked to be human prints, but then seemed to change into something that looked as if a squid had pulled itself onto the land and was dragging itself through the snow. After several days, the whole team was hearing voices. They also realized they had left their tissue analyzer back at a previous camp and would have to backtrack to retrieve it. As they moved away from the creature, they expected it to now increase in size, but it didn't. It stayed the same. Either something had changed about the anomaly, or SCP-2764 was moving towards them. After recovering the tissue analyzer, they continued on towards the creature again. Commander Mann began to understand the voices he was hearing and could even make out certain words like snow and back. Their perception of time was affected too. Hours seemed to stretch out or pass by in the blink of an eye. The voice he was hearing started to become more direct and the message was clear, turn back. Mann was compelled to press on though, even with the extremes of the Antarctic cold beginning to weigh on him. But then, SCP-2764 suddenly vanished flickering out of existence, and the team was left with no choice but to follow the strange tentacle-like tracks in the snow, hoping they would lead to the creature. The tracks led them back to their old tent, the same one they had left the tissue analyzer at before, which should have been impossible based on the time and distance they had walked. Just then, Commander Mann realized that he had been wrong. They were the ones who had been pursued. They hadn't been following the tracks forward, but backwards to where they had been. Even worse, he realized that his team had disappeared. He was completely alone. Commander Mann continued to trudge through the snow, walking without direction, when he spotted SCP-2764 again. It was circling him, trying to maintain its distance, but he raced towards the creature and sliced off a piece of its flesh for analysis. Something strange happened when he placed it in the analyzer though. The machine displayed a zero, which was the reading for human tissue. This strange result required further analysis from the Foundation researchers who should now have arrived to take over the investigation, so Mann began to make his way back in the direction of home. He spotted what looked to be members of his team off in the distance, and assumed that they must be on a mission to rescue him. Try as he might though, the spatial anomalies prevented him from ever getting closer. It felt like it would take him an entire day just to walk a few feet. He assumed it must be the same for his rescuers, as he watched them off in the distance, seeming to never get closer. At one point, he could even see as they stopped and turned back, appearing to return to an old campsite. He couldn't understand what they were doing, but then they disappeared entirely, only to reappear much closer to him. Commander Mann, now sure that there was something terribly wrong happening, tried to approach the now single rescuer he could see to tell him to turn back, but before he could. The man rushed at him with a knife and cut a piece of his flesh from his back. It's at that point that Commander Man finally started to understand. He hadn't been watching a rescue team come for him, he'd been watching himself. He had been walking towards the creature, and yet at the same time, he had also always been the creature. Commander Man was trapped in a time loop where he was doomed to transform into the monstrous SCP-2764 and then watch himself meet the same fate over and over again forever. The voices he had been hearing telling him to turn back were his own, words of warning that he was doomed to always ignore. SCP-2764 has been classified as Keter and is currently located in a classified area of Antarctica. A 150 kilometer radius has been established around the object, which is to be monitored at all times by Mobile Task Force 8 of 5. Any civilians that come within the 150 km radius either by accident or due to SCP-2764 flickering to a populated area are to be administered Class A amnestics, and any civilians that may have knowledge of the event are to be administered Class B amnestics. Should any civilian or Foundation employees come within 30 km of SCP-2764, they are to be detained and immediately questioned. Following their psychological examination and depending on the results of the evaluation, they will either be administered Class A amnestics or terminated. A climber struggles on the side of the mountain. 
He's so close to the summit of Mount Everest that he can taste it. He just needs to triumph over this last difficult section, and he will have fulfilled his lifetime dream of standing at the top of the world. He needs to hurry, though. At this altitude, the air is so thin and the temperature is so cold that your body is slowly dying. There's a reason this topmost section of the mountain is known as the Death Zone. He glances down behind him and spots something. Is that another climber? That's strange, he thinks. He was at the very back of his group, and there shouldn't have been anyone else coming up behind him. It must be a solo climber. The soloist doesn't look to be moving, though. He's just staring at him, and the climber can't seem to take his eyes off him. Suddenly, the climber starts feeling odd. He begins to feel warm and comfortable. The aches and pains of the long journey melt away. He decides to sit down on a small ledge and relax. He watches as the solo climber comes towards him. He must be a professional with the way he effortlessly moves up the mountain. He watches him make great time, getting closer and closer. He loses sight as the solo climber reaches the same difficult section he had been struggling with. He imagines the solo climber will soon zip past him on his way to the summit. But just then, the soloist pops up right in front of him. He clasps his hands on the climber's shoulders and pulls him close, staring into his eyes with those dark black goggles. They feel like they're pulling him into their depths, and there's nothing he can do to resist it. The climber tries to scream, but all that comes out of his mouth is silence. Hi, I'm Dr. Bob, and this is SCP-1529, also known as King of the Mountain. But first, a quick personal request from me. I need your help to spread the word about the lesser-known anomalies in the SCP Foundation's archives. The best thing you can do to help me is subscribe, turn on notifications, and then go tell your friends to do the same. This is a huge help and will let me bring you more and more SCP videos. Now, back to our file. SCP-1529 is an entity with a humanoid appearance that resides near the summit of Mount Everest in Nepal. It is only found above 8,000 meters, which places it in the part of the mountain referred to as the Death Zone, where oxygen levels are too low to support human life for any extended period of time. It is roughly equivalent to an average human male in height and weight, and its outer appearance resembles normal mountaineering clothes, with a heavy parka, pants, and boots that are all white in color. Its face is completely obscured by a large hood, with the only visible detail being a pair of large, dark goggles. SCP-1529 has never been seen wearing any other outfit, and in fact, it is unknown whether these are articles of clothing at all, or if they are actually a part of its body. The SCP Foundation first became aware of an anomalous entity lurking near the top of Mount Everest in the 1970s, when climbing expeditions to the summit became more commonplace among professional and amateur mountaineers alike. Rumors began to spread and told of a monster that was killing unfortunate climbers. In 1999, the body of George Mallory, who is believed to be the first person to reach the top of Mount Everest, was located, and photographic film found on his body was developed. From those pictures, it is now known that SCP-1529 was present at least as early as his 1924 expedition. When sufficient daylight and a lack of cloud cover allows observation of the peak by telescope, SCP-1529 can be seen sitting or lying on the mountain, apparently motionless in an inactive state. These motionless periods have been seen to last anywhere from 17 minutes to as long as 8 months. When active, though, it can be seen summiting and descending the upper portion of the mountain, though it never uses any climbing tools and will ignore established climbing ropes and ladders that have been installed by other climbers. It has also been observed easily traversing portions of the mountain that are considered too difficult or altogether impossible by experienced climbers. Additionally, SCP-1529 is not impacted by the freezing temperatures, extreme wind speeds, or low oxygen levels at the top of the mountain, and it has never once been seen to stumble, fall, or even lose its grip. It is unknown what prompts SCP-1529 to become active or enter a resting inactive phase, nor has there been any established correlation of these phases to weather, time of year, or traffic on the mountain. Its active periods have been observed to last between mere hours to several days, but the exact amount is hard to know for sure. Nighttime observation of 1529 has so far been impossible even with thermal imaging cameras since it produces no heat, with its temperatures being the same as that of the surrounding environment. When in its active phase, if a human climber passes the 8,000 meter mark, then SCP-1529 will begin to make its way towards them. 
putting itself in the path between the climber and either the summit if they are ascending, or their camp if they are descending. It seems to prefer to go after solo climbers, or those that are significantly ahead or behind their climbing group, but it has been observed targeting climbers in a group when a solo opportunity is not available. Once SCP-1529 is within eyesight of its targeted climber, it will attempt to gain their attention and then lock eyes with them, which produces a hypnotic effect. The climber will find that they are unable to break eye contact with SCP-1529, and will then begin to experience feelings of warmth and euphoria, similar to the effects of hypothermia and hypoxia, also known as altitude sickness. The victim will feel the overwhelming desire to sit down where they are, and once they stop moving, SCP-1529 will quickly close the distance between them. Once SCP-1529 reaches the victim, death is almost a certainty. An examination of bodies has shown the cause to be from hypothermia. Strangely, it's been observed that victims seem to succumb within just one to two hours after having first made eye contact with SCP-1529, a period of time much shorter than usual for climbers trapped on the summit of Everest. After death, the victims' bodies experience an accelerated rate of decay and after mere hours or days, the bodies become rotted and mummified at a level comparable to bodies that have been exposed to the wind and cold of the mountain for decades. Many of the over 200 deaths on Mount Everest have been attributed to SCP-1529, and the rare survivor of an encounter is almost always due to the intervention of another mountaineer, who was able to offer assistance to the entranced climber before SCP-1529 was able to reach them. There have been several notable reports from survivors of interactions with SCP-1529. One, known as Incident 1529-1, is also the only documented instance of SCP-1529 descending below the 8,000-meter mark. During the incident, the entity entered Camp 5, located on the northern approach of the mountain at 7,775 meters, which resulted in multiple deaths, including two Foundation personnel who were operating the monitoring posts. One climber, who had initially believed to have been killed in the incident, was discovered to still be alive two days later when Foundation personnel were conducting investigations at the camp. He was safely removed from the mountain, though he required the amputation of several frostbitten fingers and toes. During an interview with a Foundation agent, they described spotting SCP-1529 just ten minutes after leaving the summit of the mountain. After locking eyes with the entity, they began to feel happy, comfortable, and relieved like they were back at home next to a warm fire, but then suddenly the warmth was gone, and they experienced a sensation of cold more powerful than anything they had felt before. They were stuck, and could only watch as 1529 made its way towards them. When it finally reached them, it placed its hands on their shoulders and pulled them up into its face so that they were staring right into its black goggles. Images began to appear in the dark depths of the goggles. People warm and happy, sitting next to fires, in hot baths, or sunning on a beach. They tried to resist the strange pull of the creature with all of their might. They then heard something in their mind, a question from SCP-1529. It asked, you would refuse my gift. The stranded climber struggled to answer, using all of their willpower and strength to move their lips and whisper a single word, yes. SCP-1529 responded by showing more images of people but this time, they were bodies lying dead in the snow. Countless victims trapped on Mount Everest forever. SCP-1529 made them watch their deaths play out in long, drawn-out detail, a witness to every second of their demise. The climber was sure they would soon join them, but then they found something deep inside of them, a spark of life, a will to resist. They clenched their fist, and with their final ounce of strength, they punched SCP-1529. The goggles appeared to crack, and the next thing the climber knew, they were woken up by the Foundation recovery team. Following this encounter, the climber never attempted to summit another mountain. When they eventually passed away some years later, an autopsy revealed that their cause of death was consistent with extreme hypothermia, frostbite, and cerebral edema, despite not having been in a cold environment or above 500 meters in altitude in the previous 12 months. SCP-1529 has been classified as Euclid and is to be kept under telescope and satellite surveillance whenever possible, though telescope observation should make use of a delayed video feed, as observers have reported seeing SCP-1529 appearing to stare back at them, and reported feeling symptoms consistent with an encounter, including hypothermia and frostbite. 
The Foundation maintains communication with civilian mountaineering expeditions to prevent summiting attempts when SCP-1529 is active. The bodies of any victims are to be removed from the mountain, if possible, for autopsy, with their deaths being officially classified as having been from natural causes related to altitude sickness and hypothermia. Any survivors of encounters with SCP-1529 are to be debriefed and administered amnestics. Mobile Task Force Psi-29029, also known as Alpine Echo, is to remain on standby at all times at a permanent monitoring station with on-duty members remaining in a pressurized environment acclimatized to 7,900 meters above sea level, allowing them to quickly deploy via helicopter if need be. Finally, and most troubling, is that aerial surveillance of another mountain has revealed an individual similar in appearance to SCP-1529. The location remains classified, and the local government has prohibited climbing on the peak, so threats to humanity are minimal at this time. But the Foundation will continue to monitor it and other mountains for anomalous activity. A woman runs through a house, screaming and crying for help. She looks behind her and catches a glimpse of a shadowy figure in the next room, and it's coming towards her. She screams again and runs in the only direction she can to get away from it, up the stairs. She runs into the bathroom at the top of the stairs and locks the door behind her. She is breathing heavy as she quickly takes stock of her situation. There's a window, but it's much too small for her to fit through, and even if she could, She'd probably break her neck trying to drop to the ground below. There's no way out. She's trapped. But she has an idea. She takes a deep breath, giving herself a brief moment to gather her courage before she unlocks the door and opens it. She steps onto the landing and spots what she's looking for, a telephone on a small table. But then she also sees the shadow of the thing chasing her coming up the stairs. She runs to the phone and picks it up before running back into the bathroom again. She shuts the door behind her and starts dialing 911, but just as she's about to dial the last number, the phone is ripped out of her hands and slams against the door. She runs to pick it up again, but when she does, she finds that the cord has been cut. There's got to be something else she can try. She rushes to the medicine cabinet and starts searching for anything she can that might help her. She frantically looks for something, anything, but is startled by a loud noise. She turns to see the door bulging on its hinges again and again. Her pursuer is trying to kick it down. She goes back to searching the medicine cabinet. There must be something she can use. The woman closes the medicine cabinet, and for a second, time seems to stop. She stares at herself in the mirror, a look of confusion on her face. She mouths the words, help me, to herself in the mirror. The door suddenly bursts off the frame and slams to the floor. The woman spins around holding the only thing she could find, a toothbrush. Her pursuer steps through the now empty doorway. He's a large, terrifying looking man with wild yet focused eyes, and he's holding the biggest knife she's ever seen. The man approaches and the woman cowers in fear. He pauses for just a moment, admiring himself in the medicine cabinet mirror and smiling, seemingly very happy with how this entire scene has unfolded. The man then raises the knife above him as the woman holds up the toothbrush as if it will somehow protect her but it can't, and the man brings down the knife again and again and again. This murder may have occurred over 40 years ago, but its memory is more alive than you might think. Sometimes what happened in the past doesn't stay there and finds a way to repeat itself again and again and again, though maybe not in the way that you expect. So join me, Dr. Bob, and find out exactly why SCP-987 is known to the SCP Foundation as the Gruesome Gallery. SCP-987 is a collection of 13 different wall-mounted mirrors of varying shapes and sizes, which have been designated as SCP-987-A through M. Over half of the collection consists of medicine cabinets, but the others range in size from small makeup mirrors to full-length mirrors, with the largest measuring one by one and a half meters. The aesthetic style and materials used indicate that all the mirrors were produced between the 1940s and the 1990s, and there's nothing about their construction or immediate appearance that would give the impression that they are anomalous at all. Photos and video of the mirrors also show them to be perfectly normal mirrors, with the surfaces reflecting exactly as you would expect. In all, it appears at first glance that these are completely normal mirrors, though more in-depth research into the mirrors has been made difficult. You'll see why later. SCP-987 mirrors will finally reveal their strange and unnerving characteristics when a person stands directly in front of them and looks at their surface. 
When they do, they won't see their reflection as they expected, but an image of a completely different place. It was theorized by researchers that these locations being shown were the mirror's previous location, and research into the origins of the mirrors have revealed the original locations of mirrors C, K, and M, which confirmed this theory to be true. But the mirrors don't just show a static location. When someone looks directly into the mirror, they will see an entire scene play out, one that always depicts someone's extremely violent and or gruesome death. Each mirror depicts a different scene and location, though most of them appear to take place in a bathroom of some kind. The scenes shown vary in length, with the shortest being just 48 seconds and the longest running for over 4 minutes. After the scene finishes, it will simply start again, like a video that has been set on repeat. But the strange qualities of SCP-987 don't stop there. After the video loops and repeats itself twice, the images will start to change. The person in the mirror who is about to suffer a horrific death will seem to become aware that someone is watching them through the mirror. They will often begin soundlessly pleading with the viewer to help them, growing more emphatic as the scene evolves. If there is an aggressor present in the scene, they too will sometimes seem to become aware that they are being watched through the mirror, and may even appear to interact with the person who is watching them by making hostile gestures or writing on the surface of the mirror. Three of the victims portrayed on the glass of SCP-987 mirrors have been identified, the previously mentioned SCP-987-C, K, and M mirrors. SCP-987-C depicts a well-to-do 62-year-old male in the bathroom of his California home in 1968. The man is bound and kneeling on the floor when a young Asian woman dressed in lingerie enters the room and proceeds to strangle the man to death. The scene will repeat one time and then begin to change. In this instance, the woman will usually stop at the mirror after she enters the room to reapply her lipstick. She will then kiss the mirror, leaving a red imprint on the glass before asphyxiating the man on the floor. When looking into SCP-987-K, the viewer will see a 34-year-old man in the hallway of his home which has been identified as being in Maine during the early 2000s. The man is standing on a ladder while he installs a new chandelier in the ceiling. After a moment, the man loses his balance and becomes entangled in the elaborate lighting fixture. As he struggles to compose himself, he accidentally pulls a length of electrical wire from the ceiling that becomes wrapped around the man's neck as he falls from the ladder, leading to him being simultaneously strangled and electrocuted. When the scene repeats and starts to change, the man will appear to become more and more apprehensive about his task, and his final moments will become more and more painful looking. His wife will sometimes enter as well to find his dead body suspended from the ceiling before the scene ends and starts to repeat. SCP-987-M shows a 20-year-old woman in the bathroom of a hotel room in New York City in 1978. The woman is seen to be reacting to an aggressor who was outside the view offered by the mirror. The woman looks afraid and will try to run out of the room, but a man in a denim jacket rushes the woman, stabs her in the abdomen with a knife, and flees. The woman falls to the ground and dies almost instantly. When it repeats for the third time, the woman will attempt to communicate with the viewer prior to the aggressor entering the scene, but she will appear inebriated and will struggle to communicate clearly. If SCP-987 was simply a collection of mirrors that displayed the final moments of individuals and changed on repeat viewings in odd and frightening ways, that would be strange enough. But there's even more to this bizarre SCP. In addition to the mirrors is SCP-9871, commonly referred to within the Foundation as the Curator. SCP-9871 is an invisible entity, visible only to heat-sensitive cameras that takes up roughly the space of a two-meter tall person. The area it occupies is endothermic, meaning it drains the heat from nearby objects, in this instance from ones that are roughly one to two meters away. It has also demonstrated the ability to manipulate objects up to eight meters away that weigh as much as 150 kilograms. SCP-9871's primary behavior is to move along the ground, going from mirror to mirror in an apparently random pattern. It stops in front of each mirror for roughly 30 minutes before moving on to the next. It only engages in this behavior when alone, though, and if anyone is present, it will maintain at least a 3-meter distance from them at all times. The only exceptions to this occurred when staff attempted to do anything to the mirrors other than gently clean them. If the mirrors are tampered with in any way, SCP-9871 will react quickly and aggressively, making any physical research into the mirrors difficult, if not impossible. Both SCP-9871, as well as the collection of all 13 mirrors, 
have been classified as Euclid and are currently contained at Research Site 14 in an airtight 5 by 12 by 3 meter chamber with concrete walls that is itself enclosed in a Faraday cage. The chamber is monitored at all times by both standard and thermographic cameras, but despite this, there have been several instances of SCP-9871 seeming to breach containment and disappear for short periods of time before reappearing in the containment cell. On at least five known occasions, SCP-9871 dissipated from both the normal and thermal imaging cameras. In each of these instances, when it reappeared, a new mirror materialized as well, which has led to the Foundation's original collection of 13 mirrors growing to 18 in total, and it seems likely that this number may continue to increase. While in most cases, SCP-9871 returns with a mirror that depicts a death that occurred long in the past, in one especially chilling instance, the 9871 entity disappeared a full 15 minutes before the death took place. When it returned, it had the mirror depicting the freak accident death of a man being killed by his own chandelier. Whether SCP-9871 had any hand in this death, or perhaps even all of the deaths, is currently unknown. What does seem likely? is that the presence of the mirrors in Foundation control is the only thing that keeps SCP-9871 in containment, at least most of the time. But be careful the next time you're performing a dangerous task and notice that a mirror is in view. You never know who, or what, may be watching. A gigantic monster stomps across the land, with nothing able to stop its rampage except for, Come and eat! cries out a voice, and the monster suddenly stops and falls to the side. The child picks up his toy and runs back to where his mother and father have spread out a picnic lunch. As they eat, the boy asks his father about the nearby buildings, a series of six identical structures, each of which is a small rectangular building with a satellite dish on top of it. The weathered buildings look like they have been out here for some time, and the father tells the boy that he isn't sure exactly what they are or what their purpose is, but that they were probably built during the war. What war? the young boy asks. The Pacific War, his father answers. What was that? It was a war fought by many countries of the world. Why did they fight? The boy asks. Well, there were a lot of reasons. What were some of the reasons? The father has played this game many times before, and he knows if he doesn't end this line of questioning now, that he'll never be able to eat his lunch. The mother, sensing the same, tells the boy that if he wants to, he can go and play with his toy some more. The boy doesn't need to be given the option again. He quickly gets up and grabs his toy monster before running off to play. Don't go too far! His mother calls out as she watches her son head in the direction of one of the buildings. The boy stops in the shadow of one of the large satellite dishes and sits down in the grass to resume his monster's path of destruction across the countryside. As the monster moves through the tall grass though, the shadow he is sitting in suddenly starts to shift. The boy looks up to see that the satellite dish on top of the building is moving. With a groan, it begins to turn and change its angle. And it isn't just the one on the building closest to him that's moving. He can see that each of the six satellite dishes are doing the same thing. They're all turning to point towards the same spot on the horizon. The boy squints in the sunlight and sees what they're all now directed towards. Off, far in the distance, is a real monster. It's a massive looking creature, a huge half fish, half lizard, covered in scales and spiky fins. It must be at least 50 meters tall or more, and it's coming straight towards him. The boy can already hear the sounds of its giant webbed feet stomping and shaking the ground, and as it gets closer, its high-pitched shrieks and cries become audible too. Adding to the cacophony, an air raid siren begins to wail, followed by the sounds of gunfire, the marching of hundreds of boots, and the roar of engines. The boy looks around, but he doesn't see any of it. It's just him, the buildings, and the monster. The boy can't run, though. He's frozen in fear. All he can do is watch as it swipes at trees and power lines, knocking them down with ease, all while getting closer and closer. The satellite dishes finally finish their slow alignment, and there's a loud humming noise, followed by a loud cracking sound, as each one emits a bright beam of electricity at the monster. The creature stops its assault and howls in pain as the six satellites focus their beams on it. The beams disappear, and the monster appears stunned, but then it looks up and continues to come forward, this time even faster than before. The monster is only hundreds of feet away now, and the boy doesn't know what to do. He's too scared to even scream for help. He closes his eyes and starts to cry when he's abruptly lifted into the air. The boy opens his eyes to see that it's his father. He picks up the boy and starts to run as fast as he can. The boy can see over his father's shoulder that the monster has not changed its course to follow them. It seems to still be focused on the building he was playing next to. 
The monster finally reaches the building and begins swiping at it, tearing it apart as the other satellites slowly realign, all pointing at the creature once again. The sound of the invisible army increases, and the monster reels as if it is struck by unseen weapons. It suddenly rears back in pain as an artillery shell appears just feet away from it before exploding in the creature's face. But nothing seems able to deter it, and it keeps clawing at the building with the satellite dish. The father finally reaches the mother, who grabs the boy and embraces him tightly. There is a loud noise, and the family turns to watch as the monster finishes destroying the building and turns its attention to one of the others. But then the dishes unleash another blast of electricity at it with a thunderous crack. The creature howls in pain as it stumbles and falls to its knees. It is struggling to get back up when yet another blast hits it and it falls to the ground. It breathes a couple of final, labored breaths before it closes its eyes, its enormous tongue lolling out of its mouth. The creature is finally dead. A loud celebratory cheer goes up in the empty field from what sounds like hundreds of people as the creature begins to slowly fade from view before eventually disappearing completely. Meanwhile, all the family can do is stare in amazement at the bizarre scene they have just witnessed. The extremely strange events that just befell this average family may sound like the plot of a movie, and in some ways, it was, because this is SCP-2954, also known as Looping Kaiju Killing. SCP-2954 is an anomaly that consists of several distinct components. The first, SCP-2954-1A, are the six large structures that resemble buildings with satellite dishes, which are located near a now-deserted rural town in Japan. The word resemble is very important, because these are not actual satellite dishes, but instead appear to be nothing more than facsimiles of real ones. The interior of the SCP-2954-1A buildings lack all of the mechanical components one would expect to find inside, and instead contain only a crude rope and pulley system, which control the satellite dishes on the building's roof. Despite their lack of internal machinery, the satellite dishes are nonetheless somehow capable of discharging powerful electric arcs of energy, which they only do when confronted by an SCP-2954-2 instance. SCP-2954-2 refers to creatures which have a mix of reptilian, amphibious, and fish-like traits. They are always 50 to 60 meters in height, and most of their body is smooth and blue-gray in color, except for their scaled underbellies, which are red. Both their back and forearms have large spiny fins, and SCP-2954-2 instances walk upright on two legs, though they are always hunchback. Their mouths are also always agape, and are capable of spitting a highly corrosive acid. These creatures appear during a period of time that have been designated as Subaraya events. These events, which start every seven days, consist of a single instance of SCP-2954-2 manifesting near the SCP-2954-1A buildings before it begins destroying its surroundings. The buildings will then activate, turning their attention on the creature and firing their electric arcs at it in an attempt to stop its rampage. This will cause SCP-2954-2 to focus its attention on one of the buildings, which it will then try to destroy. As it does so, the sounds of weapons being fired, vehicles moving, and orders being shouted in Japanese can be heard. This phantom army, which has been designated as SCP-2954-1B, is only heard, not seen, and there are never any physical signs of their fight, save for the creature's own reactions to the weapons and the occasional artillery shell that will materialize in midair before striking it. During these Subaraya events, the SCP-2954-2 instance will always destroy at least one of the satellite dish buildings, and various other explosions roughly equivalent to what would be expected from small vehicles being destroyed will also be seen as it fights back against the 2954-1B army. Eventually, the combined assault of the 1A and 1B forces will be enough to overwhelm the creature, and it will collapse, grow transparent, and eventually disappear completely. A disembodied cheer will be heard, presumably from the 1B army, and any damage to the environment, including the 1A buildings, will be reversed. But what is the cause of this endless cycle of destruction and restoration? Where do the creatures come from, and what do they want? And who is the invisible army that always stands ready to fight back against the rampaging monsters? The answers to those questions may have been discovered while exploring the area where the Tsuburaya events take place. There, in another small abandoned building, SCP Foundation agents discovered a trove of objects that may shed some light on just what these creatures are. The objects located included various movie posters, film reels, and documents that appear to be related to the production and distribution of motion pictures. The posters seem to depict creatures quite similar to the SCP-2954-2 instances, 
and the title of the poster when translated from Japanese reads, Fukairu's Assault. When agents viewed the footage on the film reels, they found that it depicted a scenario quite similar to the Tsuburaya events. Also of interest are a series of notes found within a filing cabinet inside of the building, with several being of particular note. The first, when translated from Japanese, reads, Our sponsor gave 20 monsters to shoot. We'll pick the best footage. The second, which is dated to 1974, says, Filming completed. Don't forget, call our sponsor to say further shipments are unneeded. The third and fourth are both addressed to what may be the film's producers, and they read, Do you need more Fukairu? We can resupply until you're satisfied. And, You have not replied for a while. Regardless, we will send another shipment. Happy filming. But perhaps strangest of all is that there are multiple similar versions of the last note, and while the oldest is dated to 1972, additional instances continue to appear to this day, with new letters sporadically manifesting inside of the filing cabinet. The obvious danger that is caused by a rampaging 50-meter-tall monster is clear, and this anomaly has been classified Euclid as a result. Though since the creature is inevitably always killed by the SCP-2954-1 forces, containment is instead focused on keeping the public away from the area. Guards have been stationed around the area to prevent civilians from entering during Tsuburaya events, and any members of the public who do manage to witness an event are to be administered Class A amnestics. What is the origin of these looping kaiju? Did someone attempt to harness an anomalous source in order to produce special effects for their film? If so, were they killed by their own creation before being able to turn it off, leading to a never-ending cycle of attacks? While we may never know the answer for sure, at least the result is entertaining. Provided you keep your distance, that is. The final bell rings, signaling the end of a new class's first day at middle school. A girl exits the building, her backpack slung over her shoulder, body hunched under its unfamiliar weight. It's been a long and tiring day. Her family just moved to this small Oklahoma town from the big city, and of course, she's spent every minute since then trying to adjust to her new surroundings. It's never easy to be the new kid in town. Right now, all she wants to do is to get home and relax. She doesn't want to think about school and its related anxieties for the rest of the night. As she walks down the stairs, she notices the school bus parked at the curb. Thank goodness, she thinks. I can't wait to get out of here. This day can't end soon enough. But for some reason, something about this bus sets her nerves on edge. What is it that just seems… off? There's nothing blatantly wrong with the bus, but when she looks closer, she realizes that it definitely looks a little strange. The different parts of the bus just don't add up. Some parts are new, clearly just off the factory floor, while others are battered and bruised from long-time wear. Some parts even seem to come from different makes and models of bus. I guess it's not that strange, she thinks. After all, her old school always had a measly budget. You could practically see the road through holes in the floor sometimes. Her new one probably just has those same issues. Aren't those problems all over the country, after all? The school probably just had to buy a dilapidated old bus cobbled together from random parts to make ends meet. And besides, she thinks as she watches her classmates pile onto the strange bus without a second thought, none of the other kids seem to think that there's anything weird going on. This must all just be in my head, she thinks. I'm probably just being weird because I'm so tired. I can't let myself become the new girl and the weird girl. The girl is startled as she hears a voice behind her. Hey! She turns and sees a boy that she recognizes. He sits behind her in class. They haven't spoken before now, but he seems friendly enough. You're the new kid in school, aren't you? He says. Yes, my family just moved to town. She tries to talk to him, but she can't help but keep getting distracted by the weird bus. Right, right. The boy glances at the bus, as if he can sense her discomfort with it. You worried about the bus? I was pretty nervous my first time riding it, but I don't worry about it anymore. You get used to it, he tells her. Uh, right, she says. The girl feels her cheeks going red with embarrassment. She doesn't want her classmate to think that she's scared of riding a bus. What if he tells the other kids that she's frightened of a bus ride? They're all going to think that she's some kind of silly baby. I'm not scared of the bus. It is just a bus, right? The boy grins, as if he knows something that she doesn't know. The girl doesn't want to admit her fear, and so with a defiant step, she climbs the stairs and enters the bus. Once she's on board, her unease doesn't go away. The first thing that she notices is that there is no one in the driver's seat. That's weird. Did the driver just step away to use the bathroom or something? It seems pretty irresponsible to leave the bus unattended. There's a line forming behind her, though, so she doesn't have time to think about this. She takes a seat and stares out the window, keeping to herself. 
The boy from her class follows and takes a seat next to her. It's a little wild at first, but trust me, you'll get used to it fast. In fact, some of us think it's kind of fun now. The girl blinks in confusion. Who is this weirdo that gets such a kick out of riding the bus? She almost wants to snap at him, to tell him that of course she's not scared of riding the bus. She's ridden the bus hundreds of times back at her old school. But at the same time, there's definitely something weird going on here. And as much as she's trying to play it cool, she's clearly not able to hide her feelings. This boy can easily sense that she's uncomfortable. Suddenly, the bus lurches into action and pulls away from the curb. But wait, how can this be? She never saw the driver get back on board. The bus can't be driving itself, can it? She stands up in her seat and cranes her neck to see. Her eyes bulge from her head in fear and surprise as she realizes that, in fact, there's no one driving the bus at all. The driver's seat is empty and the wheel is turning by itself as the bus careens down the road. Who's driving the bus? She shouts, but the other kids barely even react to her outburst. Most of them are chattering amongst themselves, and only one or two turn to look at her briefly, before shrugging and turning back to their own private conversations. A chorus of giggles behind her alert her to the fact that she's just completely embarrassed herself. What's the matter, you scared? Calls an older boy from the back of the bus, guffawing loudly. Of course no one's driving. Don't you know anything? Leave her alone, says the boy in the seat next to her. It's her first time. She's never ridden the bus before. She's too panicked to correct him that, yes, she has been on the bus before, but not a bus like this one. What's going on? We're all gonna die! She cries, clutching at the seat in front of her in terror. Despite her fear, though, she can't help but notice that the bus isn't simply speeding into oblivion. The bus obeys all the traffic laws, stopping at stop signs and signaling before turns. It's almost as if the bus itself is alive and aware of what it's doing. That's just how it is says the boy next to her in a matter-of-fact voice as if he's anticipated her question. Apparently, this is a normal day for kids here in this Oklahoma town. The girl doesn't think she could ever get used to a bus that drives itself, but what comes next is going to prove to be even stranger. But you might want to close your eyes for this next part, says the boy. The girl asks him what he means by that, but before he can answer, she feels a strange wave of sudden nausea overcome her. Her vision goes hazy, and the whole world seems to waver in her sight. But the sensation passes quickly, and everything is quickly back to normal. Or is it? She turns to look out the window. The city passing by is familiar. She can recognize many of the same buildings that she passed on her way to school this morning. But now they seem strangely… altered. The structures are in advanced states of disrepair, with broken windows and boarded up doors. The gutters are filled with trash and debris, and the streets seem to be abandoned. The bus takes a left turn down a side street, and the girl catches a brief glimpse of the town's city hall in the distance. She gasps. City hall is on fire, great gouts of hot red flame pouring from the shattered windows. Sirens echo through the air. The sky above is an ominous red, filled with angry storm clouds with jagged bolts of dry lightning dancing between the thunderheads, and she can see the funnel of a distant tornado making a touchdown in the hills. The bus briefly comes to a stop in front of the library, dutifully obeying a flickering traffic light. The library's windows are dark, but she can vaguely see shapes moving about inside. Electric sparks shoot from malfunctioning street lamps and downed power cables flail like angry snakes in the street. It looks like some terrible natural disaster has hit the city. But what could it be? Surely she would have heard some warning while she was at school. It wouldn't have just carried on as usual in the classroom while the world outside burned. She turns to the boy next to her, a fearful question on her trembling lips. He seems to know what's going on. Otherwise, how could he be so eerily calm while everything outside the bus is falling apart or on fire? What happened to the city? Was there an earthquake? No, he would have felt it. Was there a hurricane? Every possible disaster scenario runs through her head as she desperately tries to think of an explanation. But what happens next reveals to her that there's no natural explanation for the strange sights that assail her eyes. As she watches through the window, a squadron of armed soldiers march down the street toward the darkened library. Suddenly the doors fly open and people pour out, screaming as if they're being chased by some unspeakable evil. The girl expects that the soldiers must be here for disaster relief, but she is horrified when, instead of helping the escaping library patrons, they instead open fire upon the crowd. The girl screams in terror, but the other kids barely even notice. They're too busy talking or laughing. One kid is so disinterested in the spectacle outside that he's playing with a handheld game console rather than watch the carnage unfold. How can this be happening? Has the whole world gone crazy? She's filled with terror as she wonders, is the whole town under siege? Is her house still standing? Are her parents safe? Where is this bus even taking her? I told you that you might want to cover your eyes, 
says the boy next to her. The bus continues on its route, passing all sorts of terrifying sights. A parking lot has been transformed into a mass grave. She watches as uniformed police line up peaceful citizens against a brick wall to brutally execute them by firing squad. Mass riots are taking place in the town's central park. People are yelling obscenities and pounding one another into pulp, while armed law enforcement officers sweep in to escalate the situation. The air is thick with screams, gunfire, and the smell of burning bodies. The shopping mall is overrun with giant spiders, which chase screaming shoppers out of the exits. She sees rats as big as cars scurrying out of the alleyways, grabbing random people with their taloned paws and biting their heads off with their long, sharp incisors. On the distant hills, she can also make out the outlines of even stranger creatures that she cannot identify. Dinosaurs, aliens, demons. She doesn't come from a particularly religious family, but the sights that she sees today definitely make her think that she might be seeing a glimpse into the maw of hell itself. The girl has never seen anything so awful in all her life. To her surprise, several of the other kids cheer as the bus drives past a gaggle of walking corpses. They're mutilated and half decomposed, but somehow still mobile, shambling down the sidewalk and moaning. How can the other kids be enjoying this? Yeah, 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 chant the kids. Zombies, that rules! Maybe we'll get to see them eat some brains for once, cries the older boy in the back of the bus with sudden glee. What is going on? repeats the girl. It's just the usual bus ride, says the boy next to her. Don't worry, I felt the same way when I first started at this school, but it's really not so bad. I mean, it's kind of cool, isn't it? The girl opens her mouth to respond, but she's suddenly overcome with that familiar feeling of nausea. The world quivers briefly in front of her, and suddenly, everything is back to normal. The sky is clear and blue, the buildings are no longer dilapidated, people are bustling in the streets, going about their usual business. There's no sign of any of the horrors that she just witnessed. No fires, no soldiers, no monsters, and no zombies. The boy next to her commented that they must have been reaching someone's stop. From around the bus, she hears several other kids groan in frustration. They were hoping that they would get to see some exciting zombie carnage, but it looks like that show will have to wait for another time. The bus slowly comes to a halt, and the girl tenses as she hears the hiss of its air brakes. The door opens, and the girl realizes that the bus has stopped in front of her house. She's relieved to see that her house is standing, and she can see her mother gardening in the front yard, safe and sound. Was it all a dream? This is my stop, says the girl, standing up as if in a daze. Uh, the first time's always a little wild, says the boy as she leaves. Don't worry, tomorrow will be easier. The girl steps onto the curb and away from the bus. The doors close behind her, and the bus pulls away, continuing on its journey. Did you enjoy your first day of school today? asks the girl's mother. The girl can only stare in shock as the bus drives away. What just happened? Did a self-driving bus just take her on a tour of hell before bringing her right to her own doorstep? Or did she really just imagine that whole experience? As you astute Foundation veterans have probably already put together, this new girl at school didn't imagine anything she just saw. That girl just had her first encounter with SCP-3583. At face value, SCP-3583 resembles an ordinary school bus, albeit one composed of completely random parts all held together by some unknown force. The bus is self-driving and in fact resists any attempt by a human to sit in the driver's seat. At some point, SCP-3583 became attached to a particular school in an undisclosed Oklahoma town for reasons the SCP Foundation still doesn't understand. Every school day, at 3.45 p.m., it appears outside of the school just as the school day comes to a close. The bus can hold up to 56 children and up to 8 adults. If it judges that not enough children have boarded, SCP-3583 will begin to honk its horn. The horn has a peculiar, hypnotic effect on all children within hearing range. They will be compelled to drop whatever they are doing and board the bus, meaning that the bus has some innate cognitohazardous properties. If the bus still feels that it hasn't reached its quota, it will increase the volume of its horn until it has attracted enough children that it can begin its route. Depending on how many adults have boarded, SCP-3583 has two distinct patterns of behavior. If four or fewer adults are aboard, SCP-3583 enters behavior pattern 1. In this pattern, SCP-3583 will dematerialize and enter a parallel reality called SCP-3583-A. SCP-3583-A superficially resembles the normal geography of the same Oklahoma town, with some minor but very important changes. The typical city landscape is replaced with a hellish alternative full of crumbling architecture, marauding monsters, shambling zombies, fires and natural disasters, and instances of military violence and civil unrest. 
SCP-3583 will travel through this terrifying hell dimension along normal bus routes, studiously obeying all traffic laws and pausing to re-enter our own reality, only to deliver kids to their own homes. Interestingly, SCP-3583 only offers door-to-door -door service and ignores all conventionally posted bus stops. If five or more adults are aboard, SCP-3583 enters Behavior Pattern 2. In this pattern, SCP-3583 will travel to the sites of mass casualty events, seemingly arriving in the days or weeks preceding the incident, where it will circle the area for approximately 45 to 100 minutes. After this, it will enter Pattern 1, delivering each child passenger to their home before then delivering its adult passengers home as well. Known mass casualty sites visited include Pompeii, Nanking, and the World Trade Center in New York. Passengers inside SCP-3583 can take photos or video through the bus window, and all footage shot from within SCP-3583 matches exactly with archive footage taken at the mass casualty site at the time that SCP-3583 supposedly visited. However, SCP-3583 itself has never been reported by witnesses at any site or seen in any archive footage of any site. Luckily, SCP-3583 has proven to be a boon to this struggling school district. The school principal noted that SCP-3583 has a better safety record than any human driver. In addition, it never calls in sick and is never late for a pickup or drop-off. Every student that has received a ride in SCP-3583 has arrived safely, if a little shaken, at their home destination. And best of all, SCP-3583 is saving the school a lot of money on both driver pay and vehicle maintenance, money that the school has used to hire a new music teacher. The general consensus of the local community is that as long as SCP-3583 wants to work as a school bus and continues to do a good job, who are they to look a gift horse in the mouth? Although it still might behoove some of SCP-3583's more sensitive riders to shut their eyes and plug their ears until they get safely home. The SCP Foundation first became aware of SCP-3583 when students began posting cell phone footage of their rides online. Although the Foundation has successfully scrubbed information about SCP-3583 from the internet, it has been less successful in figuring out what to do with the so-called school bus from hell. Foundation field agents are so far unable to explain SCP-3583's motive or operations. Conventional attempts to contain SCP-3583, such as impounding the bus or towing it to the junkyard, are futile. SCP-3583 will immediately dematerialize, falling apart into a rubble of disparate bus parts as the force binding it together appears to abandon this plane. However, SCP-3583 will always return the next school day, ready and willing to begin its afternoon shift. Agents have considered closing the affected school, but feared that would only move the problem, as SCP-3583 would simply attach itself to another school. The SCP Foundation is currently monitoring the situation and has several agents embedded within the school district posing as regular staff. Because of this immense difficulty in containment, SCP-3583 has been given the Keter Object Class. Considering the number of SCP anomalies that involve horrific bodily harm being done to their victims, it's honestly a breath of fresh air to be dealing with one this seemingly benevolent, a little post-traumatic stress disorder aside, of course. And while Hellbus may be what most around the Foundation have taken to referring to this particular anomaly, I'm going to stick to my own name, the Tragic School Bus. A woman wakes up on a bright sunny morning in Midland, Texas. It's her day off, and she decides she's going to use the time to take care of all the lingering errands she'd been putting off for far too long. She gets dressed, washes her hair, and prepares to pour herself a nice bowl of cereal. But when she opens the refrigerator, she finds… there's no milk. She'll need to see to that immediately. She steps out of her front door and notices a paper on her doormat. She bends down to pick up the pamphlet, which advertises a new supermarket opening in town. And what do you know, there's a coupon for milk attached. What a stroke of good luck. The woman makes her way into town, eager to check out the new grocery store. She parks her car and approaches the building, when suddenly, a stranger is standing right in front of her, carrying a plate of what appear to be free samples. He's dressed like a supermarket employee, but he's built like a soldier, complete with a military crew cut. He smiles and tells her that he actually works for a rival store, and points at a building across the street. He's positive that whatever she thinks she can get at this store, she can instead get at the one across the street for a lower cost and higher quality. She can't help but notice the almost unsettling desperation in the salesman's face. Something about his spiel makes her feel like she's in danger. She politely declines his offer, but he continues pitching deals and bargains at her as she makes her way into the safety of the new supermarket. The clean tiles below and the buzzing fluorescent lights above seem so familiar, yet also strangely alien to her. 
Something about this place is just wrong. But she needs the milk, so she walks down the aisles deeper into the store. She hears strange noises and looks over her shoulder. Was the bread aisle always behind her? She could have sworn she just came out of the meat and fish section. Where did they even keep the milk in this place? Every so often, there's a strange noise somewhere in the store around her. It sounds almost like footsteps, but not quite. More like claws tapping on the tiles. Is she alone in here? Come to think of it, she can't quite remember seeing anyone else since she came in. There's something so profoundly off about this place, but she just can't put her finger on what. She takes a step forward, and suddenly, the floor gives way beneath her. The tiles separate with the whir of mechanized gears as a trap door opens up. In an instant, she's tumbling down into darkness. As she falls, she can see the white light beaming in from above illuminate the edge of something metal and razor sharp. In the store above, the sound of a scream can be heard, and a soft squish of metal piercing flesh, followed by the gurgle of blood, and then the trap door closes. A tinny voice over the PA system comes on and says, Clean up on aisle six? The woman is never seen again after that. What superficially appears to be an independent supermarket in Midland, Texas, actually contains a number of strange and often deadly paranormal secrets, and that doesn't even stop it from being a successful and popular supermarket. But the weirdest part of all? It's all perfectly legal, thank you very much. Welcome to Yeah, We're Totally Going to Sell You This, or as it's known to the SCP Foundation, SCP-4703. The primary anomalous effects surrounding SCP-4703 affect not its customers, but the very legality of its own existence and operations. The anomalies shift laws to make everything that goes on inside legal, no matter how unethical or dangerous. It also often reshapes laws to protect its own interests from outsiders, and anyone who breaks these laws may experience spontaneous attacks from violent animals, the most common of which are vicious lions. Here are a handful of the unethical and dangerous, yet perfectly legal, thank you very much, things that go on within the confines of SCP-4703. The stacks of shelves are mounted on powerful pneumatic actuators that seem to shift and spin of their own accord. While this has the intention of keeping the store varied and stopping customers from leaving, it more often causes serious injury with its sudden movements. Occasionally, these sets of shelves will collide, crushing whatever is stuck between them. If a child becomes lost or separated from their parents while they're inside the store, the child is forcibly detained, and the parent or parents can only get their child back by either paying an upfront cost of $47.67 in cash, or submitting to have their eyebrows permanently removed with laser follicle surgery. There are also several dozen hidden trap door mechanisms beneath the floor in various parts of the building, each one triggered by some strange and arbitrary condition, such as saying the word Wednesday or by not saying the word Wednesday. The triggers are updated each day and displayed on the store's website in several dead languages, including Latin, Koine Greek, Phoenician, and Punic. Each of these trap doors drops into deep shafts filled with some kind of hazard, such as spikes, glitter, or poisonous snakes. Yes, that's poisonous, not venomous. The snakes are only dangerous when eaten, but victims have reported that they seem incredibly appealing, which makes resisting them rather difficult. A section on the far side of the store is marked Starving for Savings and Discounts Ad Bestias, where all the products are fenced off and also marked down by 70% or more. However, the products are guarded by no less than 15 hungry lions. Store-branded fishing rods, telescopic grabbing mechanisms, and drones are available to rent for the explicit purpose of retrieving items remotely, although this will result in far higher costs, so you will have to brave the lions in order to attain those incredible deals. There's also a roughly 5% chance that, after checkout, your cashier will ask you to kiss them on the lips. If you refuse, they'll burn your purchases in front of you, and you won't receive a refund. If you do kiss them, there's a 1 in 3 chance that the cashier will have an anomalous toxin on their lips that will cause you to drop dead instantly. And every day, at an arbitrary time between the hours of 3 p.m. and closing time, the lions will be released from the discount section to roam the store, and only two checkout lines will remain open. All items will be free during this period, but they must be scanned one by one. The SCP Foundation is currently exploring links between SCP-4703 and two other anomalies like SCP-2030 and SCP-1459, the former being the cursed hidden camera show Laugh is Fun, and the latter being a nightmarish vending machine that murders puppies and dispenses a variety of cookies in exchange. 
So then, if it is so dangerous, why doesn't the SCP Foundation simply block access to yeah, we're totally going to sell you this? Unfortunately, thanks to the anomalous legal effect created by SCP-4703, the Foundation can't just storm in or physically contain the building, so instead, they attempt to divert as many customers away from 4703 as possible. To do this, the Foundation has started a rival supermarket across the street, named Super Competitive Prices LLC. Sheldon M. Katz Esquire is an SCP Foundation lawyer and bureaucromancer a thaumatologist skilled in the art of interfacing with anomalously bureaucratic SCPs, and he is spearheading the Foundation legal team's efforts into combating SCP-4703. Untangling the complex web of legality around SCP-4703 is a full-time job after all, and in the following memo, Mr. Katz did all he could to articulate the sheer enormity of the problem they're dealing with. He writes, Counteraction of SCP-4703's legal anomalies is a top-level priority for our department and we are making every effort to resolve the matter in a way which minimizes loss of life and economic detriment. We have received a significant number of inquiries regarding the mechanism of SCP-4703's indisputable legality. Unfortunately, there are no easy answers. Law is a human concept. It exists on paper because we write it down. It exists in practice because we enforce it. Generally, we interpret and exercise the law through the scrutiny of semantics, intent, and precedent. Yet, bureaucratic hazards such as SCP-4703 are not necessarily predicated on such things. In fact, the law as most know it has very little to do with the matter. While it's not a perfect comparison, one could say that baseline law is to anomalous law as arithmetic is to algebra. Both are recognized as mathematics, but the latter is more abstract. Imagine that Timmy and Sally each have two apples. If Timmy gives Sally his apples, then Sally should end up with four. But she doesn't. Huh? She has ten. How can this be? Sally recounts the apples and reenacts the scenario over and over, but there is no mistake. Two and two make ten. It is an incontrovertible fact. You see, even if anomalies are irrational, they are factual, and it is essential that one accepts this if they wish to develop a countervailing methodology. Once Sally accepts that her four apples have become ten, she reevaluates her radix and decides to recount the apples in base four. Suddenly, the ten apples are one zero apples. One zero is four in base four, which is the appropriate number of apples. Eureka! Sally collects another four apples, bringing the total to twenty, which is two zero, which is eight, which confirms that her new paradigm aligns with the abnormality. Form follows function according to the function of the form, and at last, everything makes sense. Except none of it does, really. A well-behaved reality oughtn't conflate the concrete with the abstract. If you initially perceived a countable sum of 10 apples in base 10, then the equivalent number of apples in base 4 should be 22, since it stands to reason that changing your subjective view of an outcome oughtn't alter the physical materials in the equation. However, we live in a very naughty reality which may, on a whim, allow a young girl to wield apples unbeholden to thermodynamics. This explanation is inadequate, of course, but hopefully it goes a small way toward helping you understand why the legal department is currently occupied with a comprehensive redrafting of Texas corporate law in a quaternary semiological system. This in itself would be an exceptional feat even for the most skilled of bureaucromancers, and it is further compounded by the necessary incorporation of contingency clauses against the self-aware fact patterns that keep legitimizing rabid lions into existence inside my goddamn bathroom. We are grateful to you, our valued colleagues, for your patience and cooperation as we work together toward a solution. The Foundation is currently conducting a three-pronged attack against the forces of SCP-4703, the first being the Super Competitive Prices LLC competitive store. The second is the tireless efforts of Mr. Katz and his team against the trifling legal issues of SCP-4703, and the third is outright infiltration and espionage. Of course, when you're going behind enemy lines, it's crucial that the proper operative is selected for the job. It can't just be anyone dropped into a high-pressure situation like this, especially considering the rapidly evolving nature of SCP-4703's conditions. The SCP Foundation was more than aware that they might only get one shot at getting one of their own in and out of the building. For this task, they selected Field Agent Felicity Blandina, codename Karen of Justice. Blandina was uniquely qualified for a job like this. In personality tests conducted on all Foundation agents to test loyalty, they consistently found Blandina to be one of the most obtuse and shameless agents on the Foundation payroll. During group lunches with other staff members, she has been reported numerous times sending meals back to the kitchen when she felt they were unsatisfactory. 
and Foundation cyber analysts have detected multiple posts on various social media networks made by her, directly tagging and criticizing brands that provided products or services she perceived as being subpar. While these qualities made her a terror to the customer service staff in her local area, they made her the ideal candidate for bypassing the bureaucratic stronghold of SCP-4703. If anyone could do it, it would be Field Agent Felicity Blandina. She was sent into the building with an expired coupon under the pretense of being an unhappy customer. She spoke to a sales assistant inside the store named Daniel Paulson, who explained to her that her coupon was denied because it was only applicable when the recipient submitted to ritual castration performed by the SCP-4703 staff. Seeing as Agent Blandina didn't have the necessary equipment to undergo such a procedure, Paulson generously offered to provide her with a free surgery to have the proper parts attached, though finding a suitable donor would likely take several months. Agent Blandina, following her well-trained Foundation directives, could not be assuaged by the bargain. Instead, she pressed on, first guilt-tripping him with sob stories about her children, then her lifelong struggles with astigmatism, and even threatening Paulson with physical violence. Eventually, she delivered the true coup de grace, demanding to speak to the manager. Showing clear reluctance, Paulson agreed and led Agent Blandina to a door near the front of the store. It opened up into an unlit staircase that descended into the darkness below. At the bottom, they found a break room that appeared similar to a bunkhouse in a prisoner of war camp, containing hammock after hammock filled with uncomfortable sleeping employees. Paulson informed Agent Blandina that some of the people who work at the store were once normal civilians who'd been exploited with a number of legal loopholes and now lived inside the store full time. Some, for example, had stayed in past closing time, which had resulted in them becoming store property for a minimum of a year. Paulson himself had entered a raffle for an abs transplant and instead won servitude at SCP-4703, which he couldn't legally turn down thanks to the powerful anomalous laws of the store. As Paulson and Agent Blandina ventured deeper into the bowels of the staff area, they passed 11 unmarked doors, before finally stopping in front of the 12th and last one. She opened the door and discovered shelves and stacked boxes within. Agent Blandina expressed incredulity at the idea that the store's manager would be kept inside of a supply closet in the basement, but Paulson insisted that this was indeed the manager's office, and as he did, he pulled a string connected to the ceiling. This caused a wall of boxes to split down the middle like a secret doorway, revealing a large executive chair facing the wall on the other side of the room. Still maintaining the cover story that she just wanted a discount, Agent Blandina pressed on and approached the chair. She spun it around to get a better look at the manager and found herself standing in front of a desiccated corpse with no eyes and all of his teeth pulled out, his mouth wrenched open in a permanent, silent scream of terror. Paulson identified this man as Mr. Venatio Haruspice, the manager of SCP-4703. Paulson would have told Agent Blandina that his boss was a corpse earlier, but to do so was against the rules. Agent Blandina sighed and grumbled, I feel like I should have expected this. Paulson assured Agent Blandina that she could still make her complaint though, and the owner of the store would eventually hear it. As Paulson understood it, the body known as the manager acted almost like a kind of telephone, sending messages through to the owner. The owner would then reply through faxed messages hidden inside the cereal boxes that acted as the only food source of the staff trapped within. This Kafka-esque nightmare just kept getting worse and worse, but Agent Blandina refused to give up that easily. Agent Blandina asked him to explain the exact nature of the manager's condition to her. Paulson replied, I know that he's legally our manager. I know that he's, well, what he is. I know that one of us always has to kiss him goodnight at closing time. I know that if we tell him something, the owner knows, but the owner seems to know everything that happens here anyway, so I can't be certain that's related. What else? I know that he's empty, or hollow, actually hollow's probably a better word. Agent Blandina leaned in a little further to see what exactly Paulson meant by that, only to make a horrifying discovery. The manager wasn't a whole corpse, he was just desiccated skin, a husk somehow propped up into the shape of a corpse. When Agent Blandina asked why Paulson specified hollow and not empty, he told her that it was because a noise was sometimes heard emanating from within the skin husk. Agent Blandina wisely refused to put her ear anywhere near the manager's gaping toothless mouth, and instead, fed the hidden microphone she had been wearing down into the husk's throat. Before Paulson had time to remark on the strangeness of this, sirens and alarms began going off all around them. Paulson began to panic, yelling that the lions were incoming and the duo needed to move quickly to get out of harm's way. Luckily, Agent Blandina was able to escape with only minor injuries, but shortly after her escape, SCP-4703's legality was once again restructured to make it illegal for non-employees to enter the employee-only areas. 
The audio that Agent Blandina recorded inside the body of the manager was also analyzed by experts at the Foundation, and they discovered that, when sped up by 75%, the sound was indistinguishable from human laughter. Due to the highly strange nature of this anomaly and its containment procedures, even by SCP Foundation standards, the classes and designations applied to SCP-4703 are equally strange and complex. Knowledge of the file and the anomaly itself is relatively low tier, with restricted Level 2 access permissions. Due to the immense difficulty in keeping SCP-4703 hidden or contained, thanks to its unique legal situation, it has been given the object class Keter. This, however, is where things get even stranger. The SCP-4703 store has a rare secondary object class, Truculent. This classification is likely to be unfamiliar to most, but it is used in the specific situation when an item is unpredictable and often transformative, and the containment measures around it must be consistently updated and evolved in order to meet its containment needs. It has the Level 3 or Kenic Disruption class, meaning that it has a roughly medium potential to cause disruption, though this disruption is likely to be confined to a relatively local area. And finally, it has the Risk class Warning, meaning that it presents a high risk to all who interact with it complete with the possibility of causing severe harm, including death, though legally due to a missive sent from the law firm working in association with SCP-4703, I am obliged to tell you that it's mainly because the bargains at yeah we're totally going to sell you this are simply to die for, which is perfectly legal, thank you very much. The girl has been sitting in the waiting room for at least 20 minutes now, curled up on a hard plastic chair and staring at an inspirational poster on the wall. Her eyes are bleary and unfocused, with heavy dark circles that indicate she hasn't been sleeping well. She tries to focus her attention on the poster and read the words, but she's having trouble concentrating. She keeps nodding off, only to jerk back to wakefulness when her head starts to sag. This is what life is like for her after weeks of insomnia. She was just about at the end of her rope, certain that this was going to be her life from now on, until she happened to see an ad in the newspaper for a study at a local sleep clinic. She doesn't think much of that sort of thing, but she's desperate for anything that might help her to get a good night's sleep. Eventually, the door opens, and a technician calls her into his office. The girl stumbles to her feet and drags herself inside. Thanks for volunteering to be part of our study, says the technician. He's got a friendly smile and a soothing manner that instantly puts her at ease. It's obvious from his bedside manner that he's worked with lots of sleep-deprived patients before. He pulls out a clipboard and starts to make notes on a sheet of paper. We've gone over your application and we think that you would be a really good fit for this project. Thank goodness, thinks the girl. She had just about given up hope after that long wait. She half expected that they would simply tell her that she didn't qualify and send her home to try and figure out how to get over her insomnia by herself. So you've been having trouble sleeping, says the technician. Tell me about that. The girl hunches her shoulders. There's not much to tell. I've had sleep problems for years. I have really bad sleep apnea, so I've always been a rough sleeper. I toss and turn, and I wake up at least several times a night, but it's really gotten bad lately. I can barely even drift off to sleep these last few weeks. The technician nods. That's exactly the kind of problem that we want to look into here, he says. For this study, we're going to monitor you as you sleep and see if we can diagnose this problem. She nods. The technician keeps talking, but she's not listening. She doesn't really care about the details. The important thing is that she's going to finally get a decent night's sleep. The technician leads her to a laboratory, a large room with several simple cots arranged along the walls. Next to each cot, she sees a bank of odd electronic machines. She doesn't immediately know what they're for, but she can guess. She's participated in sleep studies before, in hopes that they might be able to help cure her issues, and they usually connect machines like these to your forehead as you sleep so that they can read your pulse and brain activity. Sorry, it's not the most comfortable arrangement, says the technician, but all you have to do is sleep. There's a bathroom down the hallway if you need to get ready for bed. When you're ready, we'll prepare you for the next step. The girl doesn't care if the cots aren't all that comfortable in the technician's opinion. This might as well be the plushest feather bed to her. After changing into her night clothes and brushing her teeth, the girl returns to the lab. She finds the technician waiting for her, holding what appears to be a perfectly ordinary CPAP machine. The girl, of course, recognizes this device. She's used these things on multiple occasions in her desperation to find a solution to her sleep apnea. They're supposed to help open up the breathing passageways to increase airflow and thus reduce the incidence of sleep apnea, but the girl has never had much luck with them. She frowns. If this study is just testing a new sort of CPAP machine, she doesn't have a lot of faith that it's going to help her much. 
The technician notices her dismay. I know that you've probably used these before, he says. This is just the first step. We want to see how your sleep cycles react to ordinary treatments before we try anything more radical. Okay, sure. The girl doesn't have the strength to argue. She's bone tired, and she's ready to collapse into bed. Without another word, she takes the CPAP mask from the technician and straps it to her face. She climbs into bed, and the technician attaches the hose to the machine next to the bed. He switches it on, and the machine begins to emit a familiar, comforting hum. The technician attaches several electrodes to the girl's cheeks and forehead. He starts to explain that these will allow him to monitor her sleep cycles and check for any anomalous reactions. She's barely listening at this point. I'll just be monitoring you from the next room, says the technician, pointing to a video camera in the corner of the ceiling. So don't worry about anything. If there are any problems, I'll be watching. The girl barely has the strength to nod her head in response. She's so incredibly tired. Already she's drifting into oblivion. The room is swimming before her eyes, her mind distracted by hypnagogic illusions. The technician's voice sounds like it's a million miles away. She's practically already dreaming. Her eyes close before he even leaves the room. The technician takes his station at his desk, sitting before a bank of video monitors. The grainy gray feed from the security camera shows that the girl is fast asleep in her bunk, her chest rising and falling rhythmically with her breathing. Nothing unusual going on so far. The technician takes a sip from a mug of coffee and prepares for another boring night of watching someone else sleep. Of course, he hopes that the information gleaned from his observations might be of use in helping this girl to solve her sleep problems. And he hopes in turn, that might help other people with similar sleep apnea issues as well. But for now, he's just staring at the screen with half-hearted interest. At first, everything is quiet. The CPAP machine seems to be doing the trick, allowing the girl to breathe quietly and sleep peacefully. The technician watches without interest as the girl progresses through the different levels of sleep, the monitors in front of him reflecting the changes in her biorhythms. It isn't until she reaches her second round of REM sleep, the stage in which a sleeper dreams, that something strange happens. Under her eyelids, the girl's pupils quickly flick back and forth, almost as if she's watching a film. This is totally normal behavior, of course, during REM sleep. The technician barely even looks up as the monitors register her transition into this new sleep stage. He's been working at the sleep clinic for long enough that he knows to expect this. He might not have even looked up if his coffee cup hadn't happened to finally run out. When he hefts his empty mug, mumbling to himself in annoyance that now he's going to have to walk all the way across the facility to refill it at the coffee machine in the break room, that's when he finally catches sight of it. It happens so suddenly that at first the technician doesn't believe his eyes. He thinks it must be a glitch in the hardware or possibly that his own eyes are playing tricks on him. He has been drinking a lot of coffee to stay awake after all, but no, it's really there. He can see that there is a second person in the room now, a large, dark silhouette standing over the girl as she sleeps. He blinks in surprise. How did someone get into the building, much less the laboratory, without him knowing? The figure is silent and motionless. It hardly seems threatening, but at the same time, it's hard not to read someone as threatening when they break into your room and stare at you as you sleep. As he watches, the figure starts to change subtly before his eyes. Soon, it's not just a solid blob of shadow, it's coalesced into a human figure, that of a large male humanoid. Its torso bulging with muscles, its arms laced with sinews, but instead of a face, this figure has the gleaming white skull of a horse. It remains standing over the girl. The girl snorts and turns in her sleep, grunting and mumbling. She's acting as if she's caught in an especially troubling nightmare and is struggling to wake up. The creature standing over her does not react to her movements. Instead, staring down at her with an eerie, unflappable calm. The grainy camera footage makes it hard to make out the details, but the technician is almost certain he can see the tiniest flicker, like the reflection of light in a dilated pupil, in the empty sockets of the mysterious stranger's skull. The skull doesn't react. How could it react, after all? It's just a skull. But its silence, with that rictus grin and empty sockets, only makes it more frightening than if it had reacted. The technician gulps and rises to his feet, his knees shaking. He can't let this go on. He doesn't know what kind of practical joke is going on, but he did promise the girl that he would be responsible for her safety if anything weird happened. More to the point, the presence of this masked stranger might jeopardize the results of the study. He hurries from the office, making a beeline for the laboratory. He doesn't exactly know what he's going to say or do when he confronts this stranger. He just knows that he has to do it. But then, he starts to feel sleepy himself. The closer he gets to the laboratory, the more his own body starts to defy him. 
His limbs feel rubbery, his eyes feel heavy, and his thoughts start to swim. Despite all the coffee in his system, he also feels himself succumbing to sleep. He's only 50 yards from the door when he finally collapses into a heap on the floor. His eyes remain wide open, staring sightlessly ahead of him, and his mouth gapes like a fish out of water. Whatever he's experiencing, whether it's something that only he can see or something in his mind, his expression reveals only abject terror. Meanwhile, at the exact moment that the technician collapses, the figure standing over the girl in the lab blinks momentarily out of existence, as if somehow reacting to the commotion outside. And when it returns, it isn't alone. A second dark figure has also appeared in the room. It too starts life as an indistinct, only vaguely humanoid shadow, but quickly starts to gain form. This one is different from the first. It's a female body, but the figure's head has a blank face devoid of eyes, mouth, or nose. This second figure ignores the sleeping girl or her strange, stoic, horse-headed observer. Instead, it starts to move, ambling toward the western wall of the room, as if it knows that the comatose technician is directly on the other side. When it reaches the wall, it does not pause. It simply phases through the solid structure, disappearing through the brick and mortar, and reappearing in the hallway beyond. The faceless woman approaches the prone body of the technician. It squats down next to him and puts its hand under his chin, turning his head so that it can stare into his eyes, or stare as effectively as possible when it doesn't have any eyes of its own. After a few moments of silent contemplation, the faceless creature places its hand against the technician's forehead. Slowly, its hand starts to move through his head, reaching deep into his skull as if its hand was as insubstantial as a ghost. Just as this mysterious nightmare creature was able to phase through the wall, it appears to be able to phase through flesh as well. After several moments, the faceless woman withdraws its hand and drops the technician's head. He slumps to the ground in response. The faceless woman stands up, and then… it vanishes instantly. At the exact same time, the girl in the other room snorts and stirs. She blinks her eyes open. For a moment, she doesn't remember where she is. Her eyes scan the unfamiliar room for several seconds before she recalls that she was participating in a sleep study. That's right, she was trying to find out if she could find any help for her sleep apnea. Ironically, she actually slept better than normal. As she removes the CPAP mask, she wonders if maybe she ought to see about buying one of these for herself. This particular model seems to work better than the one she's tried in the past. She stretches and sits up. Just then, the technician bursts into the room. He's panicked and out of breath, and he whips his head back and forth in search of the mysterious horse-headed stranger. But there's no sign of the creature now. Just like the faceless woman, it seems to have vanished without a trace. The girl stares at him in confusion. Why is he so upset? She has no clue about what happened while she was asleep. Did you see it? Says the technician breathlessly. The creature! The shadow creature! The girl raises a skeptical eyebrow. What are you talking about? She says. I just woke up. The technician starts to sputter out an explanation, but the girl just rolls her eyes. She came here to get help with her sleep, but it sounds like the technician is the one who's got a real problem. His breathless descriptions of a horse-headed monster and a faceless woman clearly sound like bad dreams to her. You would think that a guy running a sleep study wouldn't be so easily confused like that. She's pretty sure that he probably just fell asleep at his station, and now he's embarrassed to admit that he just had a bad dream. Little do either of them know that although they won't see the strange entities again, those creatures are always going to be very, very close to them going forward. What a nightmare. But what seems like just a bad dream is, in fact, an anomaly well known to the SCP Foundation. It's formally been designated as SCP-3060, but agents more often refer to it as the Dream Machine. Instances of SCP-3060 are small medical devices that superficially resemble continuous positive airway pressure, or CPAP machines. The individual materials that compose SCP-3060 instances are non-anomalous and operate in the same way as a typical CPAP machine of its size and make. The Foundation currently has five instances of SCP-3060 in its custody. SCP-3060's anomalous effects become apparent when worn by a sleeping human. When an individual wearing an instance of SCP-3060 enters their second REM cycle, a humanoid incorporeal entity, hereafter referred to as SCP-3060-A, will appear within a 5-meter radius of the individual and stand over them until they wake up. At this point, SCP-3060-A will disappear, and the individual wearing SCP-3060 will become infected. 
From that point on, regardless as to whether the individual wears SCP-3060, the same SCP-3060-A entity will appear when they enter their second REM cycle each night and remain watching over them until awakening. While instances of SCP-3060-A appear as featureless silhouettes upon their first manifestation, they quickly take on a unique shape based on each infected individual. SCP-3060-A entities have no standard appearance, and it is not clear what factors determine the final form of any individual SCP-3060-A. Since the manifestations are connected with REM sleep, agency researchers speculate that an SCP-3060-A's appearance may be influenced by an infected sleeper's dreams. So far, observed SCP-3060-A's have included a human infant composed entirely of fused teeth, an eyeless elderly woman dressed in dark clothes, a partially disintegrated humanoid composed of ash and dressed in red lingerie, a naked humanoid covered in tire tracks and showing signs of severe crush injuries, a humanoid whose torso consisted of a large mouth, and a clown. Some researchers have noted that the initial shadowy appearances of SCP-3060-A recall descriptions of entities reported during bouts of sleep paralysis, but so far, no conclusive link has been found. While an SCP-3060-A instance is present, any person standing within a 50-meter radius of the infected sleeper will enter a catatonic state. At this point, an additional instance of SCP-3060-A will appear. The additional SCP-3060-A entity will then approach the catatonic subject, phasing through solid matter if the subject is in a separate room. Upon arriving at the subject, the new SCP-3060-A instance will phase its hand through the subject's skull and then vanish, causing the subject to fall asleep immediately. All subjects touched by the SCP-3060-A entity in this manner will become new instances of SCP-3060 infected upon awakening. Awakening an infected sleeper will cause the attending SCP-3060-A to immediately vanish and catatonic subjects to regain movement. All attempts to communicate with SCP-3060-A instances have thus far been unsuccessful. People infected by SCP-3060 will inevitably suffer long-term health effects, most often associated with severe sleep deprivation. After three days, infected individuals begin to display fatigue, mood changes, impaired performance, and memory problems, all of which are so severe that even obtaining a full night's sleep does little to dent their impact. Infected individuals often report frequent nightmares, though no central themes or correlations have been observed in the content of these dreams, nor do they seem to correspond with the appearance of the infected persons attending SCP-3060-A. Within a month, infected individuals will start having visual and auditory hallucinations, as well as delusions that their mind is being controlled by some outside force. Soon after, infected individuals descend into full psychosis as they become unable to distinguish the content of their dreams from reality. In extreme cases, after at least two months of infection, hair loss, canidis subita, partial or complete blindness, somatic complaints, cataplexy, and alien limb syndrome have been observed. Attempts by medical staff to alleviate these conditions in the long term have thus far been met with failure, although sleep deprivation has ironically proven effective in temporarily delaying the onset of more severe symptoms. If no human subjects enter the area of an SCP-3060 infected individual's effect during REM sleep for seven consecutive days, or the infected individual dies, an instance of SCP-3060-A will appear. The SCP-3060-A entity will then proceed to search for the nearest sleeping human. Upon locating a sleeper, SCP-3060-A will stand over them until they enter their next REM sleep cycle, at which point, the SCP-3060-A entity will reach into their skull and vanish. At this point, the sleeping individual will become infected. If the sleeping individual wakes up before the process is complete, or if SCP-3060-A cannot locate a suitable subject within three hours, it will vanish without spreading the SCP-3060 infection. In one experiment, an infected individual was placed in a standard humanoid containment cell. Four D-Class personnel were placed in adjoining cells. When the infected individual fell asleep and entered their second REM cycle, an SCP-3060-A entity appeared with predictable results. The first SCP-3060-A to appear resembled a headless humanoid with its arms and legs replaced by spinal columns. It stood above the infected sleeper, watching without movement, even as four additional instances of SCP-3060-A manifested inside the cell. 
all five SCP-3060-A instances stood in silent observation of the infected sleeper for approximately five minutes. By this point, all four D-Class personnel in adjoining cells had gone into catatonic states, seeing as they were within the 50-square-meter blast zone established by the initial SCP-3060-A. Each D-Class personnel who was awake at the time of manifestation was observed to have frozen with expressions of extreme distress on their face. The four additional SCP-3060-A instances then began to disperse, each one moving toward a different D-Class personnel's cell, phasing through solid matter as necessary to reach the intended target. Each additional SCP-3060-A instance completed its manifestation by reaching into the skull of its target and then subsequently assuming a definite, final form before vanishing. The four additional SCP-3060-As, respectively, took on the appearance of a male human with mathematical symbols in place of facial features, a humanoid composed of tightly wound thread, a featureless white humanoid dressed in a foundation lab coat, and a featureless black humanoid dressed in a hodgepodge of regalia from different authoritarian regimes. The initial SCP-3060-A continued to stand in silent observation of the original infected sleeper after the other instances vanished, remaining so for the rest of the night until she woke up. Since SCP-3060 has not been found to differ in any way from a normal CPAP machine, SCP agents currently know very little about how SCP-3060 can cause these manifestations, who is manufacturing SCP-3060, or for what purpose. At this time, the only advice that SCP researchers can offer is this. If you're having trouble sleeping and want to make use of a CPAP machine, make sure you're buying a name brand. Otherwise, you might just be opening yourself up to a world of nightmares, insomnia, and silent but all too present nocturnal visitors. Kids get bored. It's just part of growing up. Or at least, that's what their parents would always say. Living in a small town in England, you run out of things to do by your fifth birthday. By your tenth, you want nothing more than to move out. By your fifteenth, half the kids end up in hospital doing something stupid. The kid entering the churchyard tonight is no exception. As he ducks under the gap in the chain-link fence, he catches the corner of his cast on the metal. The cast is already so covered in nicks and scratches that the new tear barely makes a difference. He has been trying to cut the cast off with kitchen scissors for the last three weeks. He'd broken his wrist riding his bike off the roof of his house. It would have worked if it wasn't for the post box being a little too close to the building. His brother calls out to him from up ahead. He's already at the door to the church. The kid hears his best friend shuffling around nervously behind him. He waits for her turn to duck under the fence and follow him into the churchyard away from the road. Even in the middle of nowhere, in total darkness, the kid can tell she's scared to break the rules. The pair of them rush over to meet the kid's brother at the entrance to the church. The older brother grins at both of them. At 21 years old, he may as well be 41. Towering over the two of them, with a few scraggly chin hairs and a tattoo on his neck, they can't imagine what his life must be like. Going to university in London, driving a car, getting tattoos, drinking alcohol that costs more than 10 quid and doesn't come from the corner store. What a life. There isn't a door to kick open. The church building is in total disrepair. Only the limestone structure is left standing. The windows have all been smashed in long ago, and the pews rotted away, leaving only some moss creeping its tendrils into every nook and cranny. As the three of them make their way inside, they look up to see the starry night sky above their heads, no roof left intact. In fact, the only part of the building that seems to still be half standing is the tower at the far end. Even in the dark, they can still make out a tight spiral staircase hewn into the stone, disappearing up into the collapsing tower. The kid grins. What to explore first? They all split up, wandering around different parts of the church hall. The kid makes a beeline for a toppled-in patch of wall he clambers up onto a window ledge and hoists himself up onto the wall, looking down at the other two. A stone gives way under his foot and almost sends him tumbling, but he throws out his broken wrist just in time to balance himself. Across the hall, his best friend is checking her flip phone anxiously. She'd said earlier in the evening that she needed to be back before 1 a.m. or her parents would be worried. It's already 12.45. The kid's older brother calls out across the church. I need the toilet. I'm gonna climb straight to the top of the tower and do it off the edge. <laughs> Watch out for rain. And with that, he disappears through the little doorway and up the spiral staircases. Very quickly, the sound of his footsteps disappears, leaving the kid and his friend alone together. The kid looks over his shoulder out of the church building.
From up on this patch of wall, he is almost at the perfect height to pick an apple from the tree next to them. If he can just stretch out far enough... There, he plucks two apples, one for him and one for his friend. He tosses it to her, but she misses the catch. Looking up at him, he can tell she already wants to go home. He grumbles and jumps down from the wall. The landing jars his leg pretty badly, but he clenches his teeth hard enough that no noise escapes his mouth. He grins at his best friend. She doesn't return it. It's late. She needs to get home soon. And the only way they can get home is in his big brother's car. Fine, I guess it's probably home time. She gives him her best attempt at a smile. The kid walks over to the stairs, sticks his head through the doorway, and calls out. No response. Great. How high do these stairs go? They can't be more than a couple of stories, surely. He calls again. Still nothing. His best friend appears at his shoulder. They both peer up the staircase. It's such a tight spiral that they can't really see anything beyond the first ten steps. It's dark in there, almost too dark to see where they're going. He gets out his flashlight and flicks it on. That should be enough light for the both of them. The kid plants his foot on the first step and starts climbing. The steps feel well worn. They're smooth in the middle and dip down slightly from years of use. One step, two steps, three, four, five. His flashlight dies. He shakes it, knocking the back of it a couple of times like they do in the movies. Nothing. Not even a flicker. He asks his friend if she has a flashlight. She doesn't. So the two of them climb in the dark. Very quickly, the stairs change shape. Or maybe that's the wrong word. They aren't changing shape, they're just shrinking. It's subtle, but definitely happening. The gaps between them are getting smaller, and the undersides of the stairs above are bearing down on the kid's head slightly. The kid stops and turns to his best friend. He can hardly see her at all in the dark. She's just a slightly darker shadow standing a couple of steps down from him. He asks if the steps are getting smaller. She tells him not that she can tell. He insists they must be. The stairs above their heads are getting lower and lower. The space is closing in on them slightly. She says she has no idea what he's talking about. Tutting at her, he takes a couple more steps up the staircase. The cast on his arm tightens. That's strange. He keeps going and, all of a sudden, it feels like a vice. The blood flow is cut off almost instantaneously. His fingers feel cold and start to tingle, his forearm swelling and bulging around the edge of the cast. The pressure building up inside it is ridiculous, feels almost as if the cast splits apart and falls off. Blood rushes back to his fingertips. He flexes them gratefully, turning to his best friend. Even in the darkness, he can tell she's peering at him intently. He runs a hand over his arm, massaging it gently. That's strange. His arm feels different from how it did before it went into the cast. There's more hair on it now, and the muscle running along his forearm feels more pronounced. He flexes his wrist. No pain, no stiffness, nothing. He isn't due to get his cast off for another month at least. Those doctors clearly don't know what they're talking about. Are you standing on your tiptoes? His friend asks from behind him. He looks down at her shadow, confused, and tells her no, he isn't. The kid apparently looks taller. Must just be uneven stairs, or a trick of the light. Come to think of it, though, his best friend does look a little different standing there below him, even just from her silhouette. She isn't any taller, but her figure looks different. Her voice sounds a little lower. His brother, that's who they're after. They'd get to the top of the stairs, find him, and see what was going on. Must just be some strange optical illusions happening here in the dark. The two of them press on, continuing up the stairs. Step after step, they go. They must be up on the second floor by now, surely. But there's no light ahead of them indicating any kind of exit, just more stairs. The kid asks his friend what time it is. He hears her flipping open her phone and pressing a couple of buttons, but no light fills the space. She presses them again and again. Nothing. Her battery must have died. That's the only explanation. She tries to tell him that it was almost on full a minute ago, but he doesn't really listen because at that moment, he sticks a hand in his pocket to take out the apple he'd plucked. Warm goop sticks to his fingers. His back pocket is full of sticky mush. Little creatures wriggle around inside it. Maggots. How had he plucked a rotten apple? It felt fine on the branch. He takes another step, hands still absently hovering over his pocket. A buzzing sound. A couple of flies brush past his fingers. What had they been doing in his pocket? He hears them drift around him and up the staircase, until suddenly, their buzzing stops. He crouches down and squints hard in the dark. He can just about make out two little flies lying on the stair just two steps away from him, both on their backs, legs curled. The kid reaches back into his pocket and feels around. The sticky mush is gone. Just some kind of dry, dusty substance is left. Strangely, the kid doesn't panic. 
He knows somewhere in his head that everything happening to him is very peculiar, yet he doesn't feel worried about it at all. To be honest, all he really cares about right now is making it to the top of this staircase. He takes off, running two steps at a time up towards where his brother must be waiting. Part of his mind notices that the jarring feeling in his leg from jumping off the wall is gone. No time to think about that now. Up he runs, each stride throwing him further and further. Somewhere behind him, he can hear his best friend muttering something to herself, something incoherent and garbled. Her voice definitely sounds different now. It barely sounds like her anymore. She sounds more like… more like her mother. The kid catches his foot on a step and falls. His best friend clatters into the back of him before she has a chance to stop. The two of them topple over, landing awkwardly on a step, enough to knock the wind out of him. She lies on top of him. Only, it can't be her. It feels like a fully grown woman, not his 15-year-old friend. She whispers to him. Her voice doesn't sound scared at all, though. If anything, she seems a little… disinterested. What's happening to us? The kid breathes heavily, struggling to get the air back into his lungs. That's when he notices the smell. Something deathly rotten is filling the staircase. Something moldy and decaying. She seems to notice it too. The pair of them stand up straight and peer up the stairs. In the gloom, they can see it clearly enough. A person slumped on the ground. The smell tells them all they need to know about this person. They should run, right now. They should run back down the staircase and out of there. Yet both of them inexplicably and in unison continue walking up the stairs, closing the gap on the corpse. It blocks off two whole steps, lying awkwardly on its side, slightly hunched over as if the person had collapsed in a coughing fit. The kid almost slips over. Something small is under his foot, something metallic. He reaches down and picks it up, feeling its shape and knowing almost immediately what it is. He lifts the lid and flicks the red and gold lighter on. A little flame fills the staircase with light, orange and weak, dancing around the stone. It is just enough to make out the flecks of blood coughed out of the corpse's mouth and onto the stone steps. It is just enough to see the scruffy little beard sprouting out of the corpse's face. It's just enough to make out the tattoo on the corpse's neck. The kid looks down at his older brother. Not just his older brother, but his older brother. Whereas before he had seemed like he was 41, he now looks like it. 41 and dead from something in his lungs. The kid turns to see his best friend. A woman in her mid-thirties looks back at him. Her hair even has a couple of telltale grays. She should look afraid, but her expression is almost blank. But there's a little something there, just enough of an expression to tell him that she's seeing the same transformation on his face looking back at her. The kid reaches up to touch his cheek. A wiry beard meets his fingertips. They should run. They should run back down these stairs and get out of here, call an ambulance and go home. And yet, the kid flicks the lighter closed, turns around, and steps over his older brother's body. As he walks up the stairs in silence, he hears his best friend doing the same. After five more stairs, his knee starts to give out. Then his hip soon after that, it gets harder and harder to stand up straight, so he lets himself stoop slightly. His best friend's breathing grows softer and wispier behind him. The pace slows down. Each step seems to take more out of him, feeling harder than the last. He needs a rest. That's all he needs. If he can just sit down for a second. His chest clamps in on itself like a vice. Blood hammers in his ears. Sweat floods across his brow in an instant, and the whole world seems to tilt around him. The kid collapses on the ground, feeling his brittle wrist snapping under him. Pain shoots through his body as his chest squeezes tighter and tighter. He rolls onto his back, gasping for air with frail lungs. The kid claws at his sunken ribcage, feeling loose wrinkled skin under his fingertips. With a monumental effort, he flicks the lighter on to see an old woman peering at him through the dark. He can hardly recognize his best friend anymore, as she gently takes the lighter from his hand and steps over his convulsing body. He watches helplessly as she continues gingerly up the stairs in silence. She doesn't look back over her shoulder, disappearing around the corner, taking the light with her. Leaving the kid to die an old man in total darkness. With one final gasp of air before his heart gives out on him, he clings desperately to one hope. She's going to make it to the top of the stairs. She has to. It is fortunate in many ways that SCP-723 is in such a remote area. While the church has stood on that site for hundreds of years, for much of that time it has been abandoned. Little is known about the history of the church as many of the events around it have descended into local folklore. What is known about SCP-723 is that it is a spiral staircase housed within an abandoned church building in an undisclosed location in rural England. 
For all intents and purposes, it is an unremarkable set of stairs. Made from ordinary limestone from the local quarry, the steps are approximately 0.75 meters wide and worn away in the middle, apparently from frequent use. If you were to look at the outside of the church, you would see that the tower containing the staircase is not particularly tall and is in a state of disrepair. Taking a look inside that tower, however, seems to show the staircase extending up beyond the height of the tower, something that seems on the surface to be physically impossible. In fact, how high the staircase itself goes is a mystery to this day, as those studying SCP-723 are yet to find a way to see inside it beyond the first two floors. This is because every object, living or otherwise, that ascends up SCP-723 undergoes a rapid aging process. Organic creatures quickly grow older, die, and decompose on their way up the steps. Other objects behave as if a great deal of time has passed. Batteries and electronic devices go flat almost immediately. Decay is accelerated too, meaning wear and tear take place at an alarmingly fast rate. This renders any conventional methods of exploring SCP-723 obsolete. Sound and video recording equipment running on battery power quickly fail. After many attempts with different technology, recording devices linked to a robust cable were created specifically for trying to record footage beyond the first story of SCP-723. However, the video recordings failed around the second story, and sound recordings failed around the fourth. Living subjects were required to transport these devices up the staircase, and so D-Class personnel were tasked with the job. Across all documented experiments, none of the subjects returned. In each case, a subtle change was noticed in the subjects upon crossing the fifth step. One subject paused, another gasped slightly, but beyond that, there was no physical or emotional discomfort for much of their ascent. Most were perfectly content to climb the stairs once they'd passed that fifth step. In fact, as the D-Class personnel climbed up the stairs and underwent the accelerated aging process, none of them appeared to be outwardly distressed for the most part. They all remained remarkably calm and almost disinterested in the way their bodies transformed before their very eyes. Video footage showed the subject's skin rapidly aging, undergoing conventional wrinkling and deterioration. Diseases appeared to develop at an advanced rate too, as one subject's body, recovered by pulling them back down with the rope they were attached to, contained tumors around the prostate and above the eye that were not present prior to the experiment. This subject was later discovered to have a family history of cancer. For all intents and purposes, it appears as if SCP-723 simply accelerates the natural aging process of the subject's body, following the same DNA instructions and deterioration that you would otherwise observe over the course of decades. D-723-7 was the subject to make it furthest up the staircase before the connection was lost. Approaching the fourth floor, the signal grew very weak, but in the noise could be heard a handful of distressed murmurings, including possible references to a door or the door and to dark and mark. Beyond this point, there is no usable evidence. Local folklore in the area indicates that SCP-723 has been producing the same effect for generations. Stories can be heard from local residents about old church congregations who used to meet in the building and would mysteriously lose grandparents, children, priests, and strays who would disappear up the staircase. It is theorized that this is why the church building was left abandoned for so long. SCP-723 was only identified relatively recently, in the early 2000s, after reports surfaced of local children going missing in its vicinity. In response, the area has been cordoned off and designated as Site-288. A three-mile chain-link fence was erected around the churchyard with signage warning any visitors to steer well clear. A further two-mile restriction zone with magnetic locks is scheduled to be constructed in the near future. Three guards are stationed around SCP-723 at all times of the day. None of them openly carry any weapons, so as not to arouse much attention from any passers-by, presenting the site as a mostly uninteresting, unsafe, derelict building. The guards are not permitted to approach or ascend the staircase, and the same goes for any SCP personnel. The only people permitted to enter SCP-723 are D-Class personnel, specifically approved by Foundation personnel with Level 4 clearance or higher. While little is known about the cause of the effect, or how SCP-723 physically works, one thing is certain. No person who has started to walk up those stairs has ever come back down again. And the lights go out on Maple Street as a young woman takes stock of her marriage and the man she once thought she knew. She sits at the kitchen counter, absently stirring a cup of tea that went cold hours ago, but she just can't bring herself to stand and heat it back up. She glances at the baby monitor sitting next to her, grabs it, and holds it to her ear. Steady, peaceful breathing. The baby is fine. No one needs a thing from her right now. 
She stares at the seat across from her, where her husband sits every morning, sharing coffee and breakfast before they start the day. She glances at the clock. 8 p.m. He'll be home soon. She'll have to face him, have to find a way to look him in the eye, force a smile. Pretend she doesn't know that he's getting home two hours late from who knows where. The thought turns her stomach. It wasn't always like this. Their marriage wasn't always a tense charade, their home a haunted house. He was sweet that first year. He'd buy her flowers and take her out to dinner. He'd kiss her in the morning before they'd even brush their teeth. He wouldn't come home smelling like his secretary's perfume. But ever since the baby, something's been different. The light behind his eyes has gone dim. He won't help with late night feedings, won't change diapers. Most of the time, he acts as if the baby doesn't exist. His own son. He just comes home, stares vacantly at the TV, and expects her to handle everything without so much as a single complaint. She hasn't slept in weeks. She hasn't been down to her art studio in the basement in months. Then, a sound shakes her from her thoughts. She hears the unmistakable rumble of a car pulling into the driveway and fixes a stiff smile on her face. Maybe she'll leave him. Maybe tonight she'll work up the courage to say those words that will change everything. I want a divorce. The baby barely has a father now. What difference would it really make? The woman's husband stumbles through the door, lipstick on his collar and the smell of whiskey on his breath. He greets her with a kiss on the cheek, more out of obligation than anything else, and grabs himself a can of soda from the fridge. She offers him some stew from the stovetop. He brushes her off, saying, I already ate. She doesn't bother asking when or how, when he supposedly came straight home from work. There's no point. She knows he'll only lie. Do you want to say goodnight to the baby? She asks. It's a test, as she watches his face for any flicker of fatherly affection. Isn't it asleep by now? It. He calls their son, It. He's sleeping, but you could still go up and see him, if you're quiet. I had a long day. I'm tired. I'll see you in the morning. She can't help herself. Him. What was that? Him. He's not a thing. He's our child. He sets the can on the coffee table with a heavy clatter. Do you have to nitpick every word that comes out of my mouth? She deflates at the outburst. No. He sighs, shaking his head. Don't look at me like that. I can't stand when you stare at me like that. She averts her eyes, looking down. Fine. I'll go up and check on him. You enjoy your relaxation time. That's it. Tonight is the night. She's going to pack a bag tonight. She'll leave and start a new life, just her and her son. You won't even miss them when they're gone. It'll be better for everyone this way. She'll just go upstairs, check the baby, wait for him to fall asleep. Then she'll just cut and run. It's not like he deserves a proper goodbye from her. She can go away, go to her sister's place. As she fantasizes about leaving him, spending peaceful days in a little country house with her son and maybe a dog, she finds that the baby has spit up all over his pajamas. She scoops him up into her arms to make sure everything is okay otherwise, and he's fine, just a mess. As she holds him, he stirs awake and begins to cry. Oh, sweetheart, oh, I need to change you and give you a bath. Shh, shh, it's okay, you're all right. What's wrong? Her husband's voice comes from the doorway, startling her. It doesn't concern you. She can't help herself. Her resentment creeps into her voice. He just needs a bath. What, you think I can't bathe my own son? He scoffs. That's it? Well, you haven't done it yet. So, when she turns to look at her husband, there are tears in his eyes. I'll do it now. Something in his voice is so sincere, she falters in her determination for a moment. Maybe he'll really try. Maybe things will go back to how they used to be. And she really, really needs a rest. So she hands the baby over to him and sits down in the soft chair in the corner of the nursery. Before too long, the exhaustion overcomes her and she nods off. In her sleep, she can't see her husband leaving the bathroom to go downstairs and catch the last 20 minutes of the Dodgers game, leaving the baby alone in the tub. When she stirs awake, the crib is still empty. She can hear the water running and she knows. She just knows what has happened. What she let happen, no what he did. A glance into the bathroom confirms her suspicions, and with a primal scream of pain, rage, and heartbreak, she tears down the stairs to confront the murderer himself. She finds him asleep on the couch and takes a moment to catch her breath, to wipe the tears from her eyes. Did he do it by accident or on purpose to punish her, to free himself from their marriage once and for all, to break her heart beyond repair? 
It doesn't matter in the end. What's done is done, whether he meant it or not. But what can she do? What could ever make this right? She wants to scream, to set the house on fire, to tear him to shreds. Then she spots it. The baseball bat leaned against the wall by the door in case of an intruder. She picks it up, feeling the weight of the wood in her hands, the heft of it. Swung hard enough with real intent behind it, it could really do some damage. Slowly, thoughtfully, she walks back toward the couch, raises the bat, and swings. It only takes one good hit to get the job done, but she swings the bat a few more times anyway as something inside of her bends and bends and breaks. Until the tears stop falling, until her vision comes back and everything stops looking like a wash of red. He doesn't even scream, never wakes from his stupor to see the look on his wife's face when she gets her revenge. He's just gone. She wipes the red from her eyes and lets the bloody bat drop to the floor. She started the day as a wife, as a mother, but now she's ending it as a killer. He deserved it, she tells herself. He took her baby from her, so she got him back. But why doesn't she feel any relief? Why does she still feel the gnawing grief in the pit of her stomach, feel the darkness clawing at her heart? First things first, she needs to get him out of the living room, out of sight of prying eyes and nosy neighbors. She could try to bury him, but where? The yard isn't exactly private, and she's not sure how much she could even dig up before sunrise. No, that won't do. Then the idea hits her, and she grabs him by the arms and begins dragging the lifeless body of the man she once loved toward the basement stairs. He's heavy, much heavier than she expected, but she supposed they called it dead weight for a reason. She grunts and struggles as she drags him down the stairs, wincing as his head bumps against the steps, before reminding herself he's not using it anymore. She surprises herself with a laugh, a dry sound echoing in the empty basement. She drags him past the last chair, and he lands on the floor with a thud in the room that she converted into her home art studio when they first bought the house, back when things were still good. Her eyes dart about the room, the half-finished paintings, the wood carvings she abandoned when she got pregnant, the paints and long dried out lumps of clay, the potter's wheel in the corner. Her eyes settle on a metal frame, large and twisted into a vaguely human shape. She had crafted it years ago, intending to cover it with concrete and paint it, but never got around to it. No, she had been forced to put it away. Her husband hadn't liked it, had thought it was creepy and odd, and didn't want her working with such heavy materials. Just another thing he took from her, another dream he destroyed. It's just about his size, now that she takes a look at it with him lying limply on the ground so close by. With a little bit of muscle, some determination, he would fit right inside. And there are the tubs of cement, still sealed tight and ready to mix, just as she left them. She could shove him into the frame, paint him with layer on layer of cement, and it would be like he had disappeared in the night. A fitting coffin for the man, she thought. The perfect place to hide him, too. No one would ever know. No bones to dig up in the garden out back, no smell of rot seeping out from beneath the floorboard. She smiled to herself, just a little bit. In death, her husband would help her finish her greatest work. She didn't consider herself a wife or a mother, not anymore, but she was still an artist, and he would be her art. As she mixes the cement, she hums a little song to herself, beginning to feel something like peace. Everything is ruined, her life as she knew it completely turned upside down, but she is here in the art studio, creating again. Not a waste of time now, is it? She remarks to her husband's body. He doesn't answer. Typical. Why get an art degree, you said? Well, it prepared me for this, didn't it? Wonder what I'll do with you when you're done. Maybe I'll keep you down here. That seems like a waste. Maybe I'll get you displayed in a gallery. Let people buy tickets to take a look at you. You'll be my masterpiece. You'd hate that, wouldn't you? Me, thriving, creating, all without you there to make snide comments and treat me like dirt. As she waits for the concrete to become usable, she turns her attention back to the metal frame. Time to put her ex-husband in his place. She lifts him and begins to wedge his body into the metal structure. He's heavy, getting heavier all the time, and left a trail of blood behind on the floor that she would have to clean up and bleach later. But after several sweaty minutes, he is in place. He looks correct to her, sitting there in the frame, ready to become something new, something different, something better than he ever was in life. The concrete is ready, and she begins to smooth it over the body and metal frame, flesh and blood, and sweat and grit, 
layer upon layer upon layer. Mix, smooth, wait, mix, smooth, wait. All the while she talks to him, weeps bitter tears into the concrete. At one point, she pricks her finger, her blood dripping into the mixture and becoming part of the sculpture. For days she carries on this way, not breaking to eat, bathe, or sleep. After three days pass, she runs out of concrete, but the sculpture is not finished. She'll need to go out and get more. She takes a shower, washing away the dust, the blood, and the guilt, changes into fresh, clean clothes, and takes a drive into town. She picks up more concrete first, telling the clerk some story about home improvements she's working on. He asks if she's married, if her husband will be helping with the work. I'm recently separated, she replies. On the way home, a small store catches her eye. It's a place she's driven by plenty of times, a little occult shop filled with herbs and tapered candles and strange leather-bound books. She isn't sure if she believes in this sort of thing, not really, but something makes her park and walk inside anyway. A gnarled old woman behind the counter spots her, and without speaking, points her toward a room in the back. It's different there, darker, filled with vials of thick, dark liquid, shelves full of skulls that might be human, though she isn't sure. In the back of the room, there is a bottle of paint, deep red and vibrant. What it's doing here, she couldn't be certain, but as soon as she sets eyes on it, she knows she needs to have it, needs to add it to her sculpture to make it truly complete. She brings it to the woman at the counter, but she just says, Take it, no charge. I can tell you really need it. Just be careful what you use it for. It's powerful stuff. She wants to ask what that means, what's so powerful about this little bottle of strange red paint, but she doesn't. She's much too exhausted and much too determined to get back home and put the finishing touches on her masterpiece. She drives straight home and hauls the concrete and paint inside, carrying it down into the basement. She's dizzy from hunger and lack of sleep, but she doesn't care. She has one singular vision right now, and she must see it carried out. She mixes more concrete and slathers the whole shape again, sculpting out the round, bulbous head, the arms at its sides, the legs and feet, the curve of the whole figure covered in thick gray sludge. In potential, a blank canvas. Before it dries, she opens the paint. It smells musty, rich, and somehow ancient. It clings to the bristles of her brush like a living thing and takes to the surface of the sculpture eagerly, spreading out as if of its own volition as she brushes it on evenly. She paints the whole thing, every inch of it. At first, it doesn't seem as if there will be enough paint to finish the job, but somehow that little bottle coats the whole figure in deep, dark red. She looks down at her hands, stained just as brightly as they were when she swung that baseball bat. She looks back up at her creation, the amalgamation of the fear, the pain, the heartbreak, the pure, primal rage, and begins to cry. The tears fall freely into her palms, and without thinking, she smears them into the concrete and paint until they disappear into the art. Then she takes a step back, watching it all dry. All of that work, all of that time, that great yawning chasm of loss, and this is what she has made of it. She loves it, and she hates it all at once, and she can't stop staring at the place where its eyes would be if it had them. She half expects to see something looking back. She shakes her head, looking down at the floor for a moment. Then she hears the sound of stone and metal grinding together. Her gaze snaps back up, and she sees that the sculpture has moved just a little, its head turned in her direction. In an instant, her husband's words come back to her. Don't look at me like that. I can't stand when you stare at me like that. It couldn't be. She stares at it for a long time, her eyes watering from the effort. She blinks. Her eyes open, and the sculpture is gone. There it is again, the grind of metal and stone against each other. Then, with the sound of bones snapping, everything went dark. Her hate, her vengeance, her desperate act of violence and creation, with a splash of the most unusual paint, led to the creation of a deadly masterpiece that would one day be known as SCP-173. The Walking Dead, dripping and rotting, with glowing eyes and sharp teeth. A huge black wolf, stalking through the woods as you walk home alone in the dead of night. Even the horrors of the SCP Foundation, the old man, SCP-106, the gray shrieking nightmare of SCP-096 and the relentless hatred and violence of SCP-682. All these things frighten people, even the staff of the SCP Foundation. 
But one question still haunts them. One terrible, awful question. What's in the attic? What's in the attic? What is in the attic? There's a certain time of night where it seems as if day will never come, where the shadows have stretched long and heavy across the floor, and the air is thick with a sense of shapeless dread. Past midnight, but far before the relief of dawn, it is the time of night when terrors come to life, where fear sits on your chest and refuses to let you breathe easily. Right now, it is that time of night in the Lee family home. And, with a knife under her pillow and disaster on her mind, Olivia Lee cannot sleep. She holds her breath, listening to the sounds of the house around her. Her siblings were asleep in their respective rooms, snoring away in the kind of peaceful slumber she could barely remember. Her parents whispering together downstairs. She can't make it out exactly, but she has a theory. They're talking about her, most likely. What else could they be discussing? After so many years of seemingly endless fighting, shouting, slamming doors, a porcelain vase or expensive china plate smashed against a wall, she can feel the tension reaching a boiling point. No doubt her parents are plotting, discussing what to do about her. They could kick her out, but she's only 17. No, she has the sneaking suspicion they have something else planned, something more drastic. That's why she snatched one of the kitchen knives yesterday, just in case. She can feel it under her pillow now, its presence radiating through the cool pillowcase against her cheek. Things have never been quite right in this house, in this family. Since she was little, she could feel an aura of wrongness clinging to everyone, to everything. It's only gotten worse over the years, condensing into a fog that chokes her when she tries to act like everything is normal. Like they're a perfect, happy family. Her parents might be content to keep up the charade, but she won't. Not anymore. She's been preparing, packing a duffel bag of clothes, food, a little bit of money, everything she needs to get out of this house, out of this town, once and for all. If they try anything tonight, that will be the sign that she needs to cut and run. Olivia's thoughts are interrupted by the sound of footsteps outside of her room. Two sets of adult footsteps, not her siblings coming to complain of a bad dream. Her parents. She holds her breath, waiting for the footsteps to pass. They stop just in front of her door. The knob begins to turn, and she curses herself for not locking it. This is it. Whatever force in this house has made them resent her all this time, it has driven them to act. As the door creaks open, Olivia snatches the knife out from under her pillow, brandishing it in front of her. Her parents look more angry than surprised, as if they were expecting this from her. They shout at her to put the knife down and listen to what they say. Olivia refuses. It's the only leverage she has in this two-on-one confrontation, and she isn't about to give it up. She snatches the bag out from under her bed, and she slowly backs her parents up against the wall. This close, she can see the desperation in her mother's eyes and smell the spirits on her father's breath. Her hand trembles, and her eyes fill with tears. Suddenly, there's a sound from above, something heavy, shifting and moving across the floor. The sound makes Olivia's blood run cold. Up there, that's the attic. There's nothing in the attic, or at least as far as she knows. She's never been up there, could never force herself to climb the ladder up into the darkness without every fiber of her being rejecting it, every primal instinct screaming at her to get away. For as long as she can remember, the attic has been a place she never wanted to go. There's the sound again, louder this time, more insistent. It turns her stomach, a chill running down her spine. Whatever's up there, she needs to get as far away from it, from this house, as possible. She drops the knife, letting it clatter to the floor, and she tears out of the room with her duffel bag. She can hear her parents behind her, calling her name, begging her to listen, threatening her if she doesn't, but she shuts out the noise. The only thing on her mind is getting out of this house. As she runs, she can hear that sound in the attic following her, somehow right above her, no matter what part of the house she's in. She doesn't even bother to put on her shoes, flinging open the front door and sprinting out into the night in her socks. The door slams behind her, and suddenly, Olivia is gone, disappearing into an open world where she can breathe again. Back inside the house, the family she left behind is still taking in the reality of her absence. Above them, in the attic, something shifts. After Olivia leaves, the mood in the house begins to shift as well. Her parents, Franklin and Yvette, had hoped that her absence would make their home seem lighter, 
but in fact, it's been the opposite. They used to be able to ignore the attic, to glance at it and feel the gnawing sensation that something important, something terrible, was waiting up there, then keep walking and move on with the rest of their day. But now, without their eldest daughter, the thorn in their side who constantly aggravated and disappointed them, the feeling is getting harder to ignore. Slowly but surely, thoughts of the attic worm their way under the couple's skin until there's little else that they can think about. The house has taken on an eerie silence. It doesn't sound like this in a house where a family of five, formerly six, but now five, live. It sounds like a grave. Franklin cracks first, gives way to the pressure to climb the ladder and see what's up there in the attic. One morning, he wakes up, drinks his coffee, and summons all of his strength, grits his teeth, and starts to climb. He grabs the first rung and begins to pull himself up. One step, one rung, then another, then another, slowly making his way up into the shadowy unknown above. He reaches up with an unsteady hand and pushes the door open. Just as his head crosses the threshold of the opening into the attic, everything goes dark. Franklin suddenly opens his eyes and finds himself sitting back at the kitchen table, his wife across from him, his children playing in the next room while the sound of Saturday morning cartoons blares from the television. He blinks, rubbing at his eyes. Was it his imagination? Did he just have a vivid daydream about climbing up to the attic? He asks Yvette, and she swears that she never saw him get up from the table. He drank his coffee, looked lost in thought for a moment, and then he snapped back to attention. She didn't see him do anything else. She shrugs it off and turns back to the newspaper. Franklin can't shake it off that easily. He goes about the rest of his Saturday as normal, helping tidy up the house, playing in the yard with the kids, and staring off into space. But all the while, he's thinking of the attic. He could swear that he climbed that ladder, and would happily swear it in front of a judge. But it didn't make sense. None of it made sense. He decides to try again, or maybe for the first time. His head aches from the effort of trying to sift through his memories and find what he could be missing. Later that night, after he and his wife settle down for bed, Franklin sneaks out of the bedroom. He tiptoes through the hall until he reaches the ladder up to the attic. Looking at it in the dark, he feels a sense of foreboding, as if his subconscious is warning him to turn back. He fights through the feeling, climbing up the steps one by one. He pushes open the door, climbs up through, and then he opens his eyes lying on his back in bed, his wife fast asleep beside him. What the hell? Did he fall asleep and dream it? But why would he dream the same dream twice, once at the kitchen table in the bright light of the morning? No, that can't be it. Still, he needs to check one more time, just to be certain. He trudges out into the hall, climbs back up the ladder, and opens the attic door. Once more, he opens his eyes in bed, as if it was all a dream. But he knows better. Somehow the attic won't let him look inside. Whatever's up there, he doesn't want to be seen. He tries to put it out of his mind, to close his eyes and drift off to sleep. But he can't stop imagining the climb up to the attic. Can't stop trying to picture what could be hiding above his head. This is his house, damn it. He should know everything going on in here. It just doesn't make sense. Franklin doesn't sleep at all that night. He just lies there, eyes shut, mind replaying the memory of his failed climbs over and over on a loop. The next day, he tries one more time, only to find himself sitting in his easy chair and watching the television. He tries again throughout the day, every time unable to reach the attic. Yvette notices the change in her husband, but doesn't dare ask what caused it. Whatever it is, he's growing increasingly distressed, angry, and terrified. She can guess what it might be about, and can feel that same uneasy feeling whenever she walks past the attic. The question of it gnaws at her, but she's afraid to try and look for herself. She can see what it's doing to Franklin and imagines what it might do to her. As the week goes on, Franklin and Yvette try their best to ignore the attic, but it grows more difficult with each passing day. By Sunday, Franklin comes home from the office with a box of his things, announcing that he has quit his job. He wants the family to move away from the house and have a fresh start somewhere else. He has a meeting with a realtor tomorrow to discuss selling the house. Yvette starts to protest, but thinks better of it. Best to let Franklin have his way when he gets his mind set on something. Besides, if they can move out of the house, maybe she won't ever have to find out what the trouble with the attic is all about. The next morning, a realtor comes by to meet with the Lees. He has great news. Someone has already put an offer on the house, and it's way more than what they paid for it. For once, things are really starting to look up for the family. 
They sit on the couch with the realtor, review the contract, and prepare to sign the paperwork. Franklin picks up a pen and gets ready to sign on the dotted line, but the instant the pen touches the paper, he's at the kitchen table again. Yvette's sitting across from him with a cup of coffee in her hand. She stares at him, wide-eyed. She didn't forget this time. They both remember being there, ready to sign away their house and start a new chapter of their lives, when all of a sudden, like the skipping of a scratched record, there was a blip of some kind, and they were back here. Franklin rushes to the phone, dialing the realtor's number in an attempt to get a handle on things. It rings once, then an error message plays, informing him that the number he is trying to reach has been disconnected. He looks up the realtor, but finds that the real estate agency he was with is no longer in business. Somehow everything has changed, and their lucky brick has vanished into thin air. Franklin throws his coffee cup across the room in a burst of rage, and it shatters against the wall in a flurry of hot coffee and ceramic. The kids stop playing in the other room, coming to check out the source of the loud sound. Yvette shoes them away, then quietly begins to clean up the mess, and they carry on that way until bedtime. Franklin goes to bed early, exhausted from seething all day about the lost opportunity to sell the house. Yvette stays up, reading a book on the couch while the rest of the family sleeps. Just as she goes to turn the next page, she hears something, a voice coming from upstairs. It isn't Franklin, it isn't one of the kids. It's a voice she hasn't heard in a little while. It sounds like... Olivia. Yvette can't quite make out what her daughter is saying, but she knows that it's her. She's certain of it, just as certain as she is of the fact that the sound is coming from the attic. She's been avoiding it all this time, afraid to become haunted by whatever has been vexing Franklin, but she can't resist it anymore. She may have run her out of the house, but Olivia is her daughter, and her mother's instincts can only be suppressed for so long. Slowly but surely, she walks to the attic and begins to climb up. Hearing the noise, the children leave their rooms to come and see what's happening. Mom, what are you doing? One of them asks, but Yvette does not answer. All she can hear is Olivia in the attic. She still can't quite make out the words, but if she can just get up there, get inside, she knows that everything will become clear. She pushes open the door and climbs up into the inky blackness above. Back below, the children stare at the ladder, listening to the sound of hushed whispers. It goes on for several minutes before Yvette climbs back down into view. What was up there? One of the children asks. Yvette turns to look at them, her face pale, her eyes hollow. She shakes her head silent for a long moment. When she speaks, her voice trembles with a mixture of confusion and horror. I don't know. It wasn't Olivia. As days turn into weeks, weeks turn into months, and months turn into years, the Lee family tries everything they can think of to make life with the attic bearable. They try to ignore it, but that doesn't work anymore. They attempt to have the house demolished, torn down so they can build something new on top of the rubble. But after they sign the papers, they wake up in bed and find that the construction company no longer exists. Franklin tries to investigate the attic again, but it just won't let him inside. If he ever makes it all the way up there, he isn't able to remember it. One day, in a fit of desperation, he takes out an ad in the newspaper asking for help from someone experienced in the unexplainable. He doesn't expect much to come of it, but the ad draws the attention of a secretive organization. A group of men come to the door to speak with the Lee family, identifying themselves as members of an organization they will only refer to as the Foundation. The men from the Foundation attempt to climb into the attic, only to find themselves standing at the front door again. They begin scribbling down notes after this occurrence, whispering to each other and saying words like cognito hazard and reality altering. The Lees don't understand much of it, but they can tell that it's nothing good. The men from the Foundation block off the house with caution tape, put up a notice of a highly dangerous gas leak, and then ask the Lees to come with them. Over the next few days, Dr. Dorset of the SCP Foundation conducts interviews with Yvette and Franklin regarding the nature of the attic and their experiences with it. He also speaks with the children that still live with them, as well as several of their neighbors. Following these interviews, the Foundation attempts several more manned explorations of the attic, as well as a few unmanned explorations. However, these attempts prove unsuccessful. In the days following these attempts, the Foundation discovers that all records of them have disappeared and that the investigation attempts appear to have never actually taken place. The research team is desperate to put the puzzle together and realizes they're still missing one piece. The runaway daughter, Olivia. 
The Foundation tracks her down, living under a new name and working as a landscaping contractor, and brings her in for questioning. She is surprisingly cooperative, almost unfazed by the bizarre situation. <laughs> Dr. Garrett is selected to conduct the interview, and he meets Olivia, now Rebecca Feldman, in an interrogation room. He begins the interview saying, Miss Feldman, what I want to discuss with you is a phenomenon associated with your parents' home, likely located in the upstairs... She cuts him off. The attic, I know. I thought somebody would come after me about that. I just didn't think it would be so soon. Dr. Garrett is surprised at her cavalier attitude toward the attic. He asks if she's aware of the phenomenon occurring in the house. She nods and says, I left my parents when I was a kid, Dr. Garrett. We... we'd always fought. They weren't happy with the choices I had made, the things I believed in, the people I spent time with. There was anger there. So much anger I thought it might suffocate me. When I left, I felt like I could breathe again. I never went back after that, but sometimes I can still feel it. You know how you feel when you're dreaming and you're trying to run from something, but you can't see it, and you don't know if it's really there, but you run anyway. That's how it feels. He asks her what prompted her to leave her parents. Rebecca looks down at her hands, folded on the table, before she speaks again. There was one night. We had a fight, and my dad was drinking, and mom was even worse off at that point, and I kept a knife under my pillow for a long time in case something happened and they came into my room that night. I don't know what their intentions were, but I drew it and backed them into the wall. The whole thing felt like I was being choked, and that was the first time I heard it. Something moving above me. I dropped the knife and ran, and I didn't look back. Dr. Garrett only had one more question for her. Whether she knows about anything in the attic. She looked up from her hands then, meeting Garrett's eyes. There are always secrets, Doctor. There's only so much hate that can build up in a place before it starts hating you back. I don't know what's in the attic, or if there's anything up there at all. I don't think I want to. With that, she stands up and leaves the room. The Foundation plans to detain her and investigate her story further to try and get to the heart of the truth, but the next day, they can't find her. As more days pass and they are unable to track her down, they come to a disquieting conclusion. According to all available information and legal documentation, Olivia Lee does not exist. Dr. Garrett insists that he spoke with her and continues to review the transcript of their conversation. She remains clear as day in his memories and in the minds of her family, but in reality, or whatever the entity in the attic molded this reality into, she never existed at all. A bear mauling you to death, being stalked by cougars in the dead of night, only to be eaten in your sleep. Wandering off the path and getting lost for days, the elements slowly withering you away to nothingness. There are plenty of ways you can die in the wilderness, but few would expect death to come as a result of a simple bodily function with a decidedly anomalous twist. Springtime in the Sierra Nevada is undeniably beautiful. The unpredictable storms of winter are a thing of the past, but the oppressive heat of summer hasn't yet crept in. The highest peaks of the mountains are still spotted with snow, but in the foothills, the wildflowers sprout from the earth, blooming in a tapestry of yellow, pink, purple, and orange. Crystal clear waterfalls roar down the rocky mountainsides, water set free from its slumber by the melting ice as the world wakes up from a long hibernation. The summer vacation crowds haven't yet flooded the hiking trails and ski slopes, but a few groups of early adventurers can be spotted hiking through the mountains, taking in the sights, and breathing in the fresh, fragrant air. Among these springtime visitors are a pair of young men, one with blonde hair and one with dark hair, each wearing a small backpack and carrying a canteen of water, not a scuff to be seen on their brand new hiking boots. These two young men are on their senior spring break from college, gleefully taking the hiking trip they have been talking about since they were paired up as roommates their freshman year. Neither of these young men is especially experienced in hiking, but they have both spent dozens of hours in the library reading up on wilderness survival, on the best ways to pitch a tent and start a fire with nothing more than a stick and two rocks. The lighter-haired of the two especially prides himself on his knowledge of foraging for edible wild plants, a skill he is excited to put to the test on this trip. His dark-haired companion is a bit more suspicious of wild plants, frightened by the stories of foraging gone wrong and unfortunate explorers confusing a delicious mushroom for one that stops the heart in minutes. 
he has filled his bag with provisions, with granola and jerky, dried fruits, and cans of beans that he hopes his friend will share with him, rather than risking his safety by gambling on a wild root or berry. Still, his concerns about foraging are soon forgotten, as the two proceed further along the trail, passing sparkling waterfalls, bighorn sheep grazing on wild plants, and a bird that just might be a bald eagle soaring by overhead. The two are lost in the majesty of nature. So lost, in fact, that they forget to eat until the sun is dipping over the horizon and the world is growing dark around them. Out here in the mountains, with no light pollution to speak of, dark is dark. Even with the help of the lanterns they brought, the two men can scarcely see well enough to put up their tents and build a small fire. Still, they remember all of their reading and manage to set up a modest camp for the night. The dark-haired man pulls a bag of beans from his backpack and begins to heat them over the flame. He offers some to his companion, but he refuses. The blonde man has found a shrub that he recognizes, weighed down with ripe fruit. This shrub, he explains to his friend, is a species of manzanita, an evergreen shrub that produces berries similar in flavor to little apples. The dark-haired man is dubious. Aren't manzanita berries typically red in color? These appear to be a shade of brown. Wait! The young man reaches out and stops his friend just before he can pop the berries into his mouth. At least let me look them up on my phone. That won't work out here, his friend tells him. The government blocks access to the web out here. They don't want you on the internet. It's a big conspiracy. Everyone knows about it. Page unavailable. His friend is right. But wait! He has the ultimate tool to defeat this intrusion on his lunch lookup liberties because he has Surfshark VPN. Surfshark, the sponsor of today's video. The virtual private network that keeps your online identity safe by encrypting all of the information sent between your device and the internet. With the simple press of a button, he's able to change his location to somewhere well outside the Sierra Nevadas and access the blocked content thanks to over 3,200 servers Surfshark has around the world in 100 countries that allow you to bypass censorship and geo restrictions no matter where you are. And you don't need to worry about who might be watching you since Surfshark masks your IP address to make sure that your city, country, and download history aren't linked back to your identity. It's the absolute best way to stay safe online and keep your personal information secure from whoever might want to use it for their nefarious deeds. So why not try it out for yourself? Surfshark offers a 30-day money-back guarantee, so there's no risk. Dr. Bob viewers who use my code Dr. Bob get an extra three months free. So use the link in the description and check it out for yourself. You'll be glad you did. The wannabe forager insists that he has correctly identified the plant and that these berries will be his dinner. The dark-haired man shrugs and treats himself to a meal of beans and dried apples, while his friend munches on handfuls of the brown berries. He has no complaints about the taste and does not immediately drop dead upon eating them, so perhaps he was right, and these are manzanitas after all. As soon as the thought crosses the dark-haired man's mind, he sees his friend double over, clutching at his stomach in discomfort. Afraid for his friend's safety, he rushes to his side, only to be met with a long, loud fart. The two share a laugh, the tension broken by the sudden smelly outburst, but the humor soon fades as the blonde man farts again, and again, and again. All through the night, he continues to emit loud, excruciatingly smelly farts. The smell permeates the campsite, seeping into the dark-haired man's tent no matter how he tries to cover his nose with his sleeping bag. He doesn't get a wink of sleep, spending the night wide awake, staring at the ceiling of his tent, and silently wishing for the relentless stream of gas to stop. But it doesn't. It just carries on until the dark-haired man can scarcely remember a time when he wasn't listening to the maddening sound. Again and again and again, the endless farts. He clenches his fists until the knuckles turn white, clenches his jaw, and grinds his teeth. It's enough to drive a man insane. The next morning, it is still happening. The blonde man expresses embarrassment, but does not apologize for ignoring his friend's warnings about the berries. He tries to laugh it off, but the dark-haired man does not join him in his laughter. If he had only listened, they wouldn't be in this situation. They wouldn't be about to continue their hike with this rancid, gaseous albatross around their necks. As they pack up camp, the dark-haired man glances down at the tent pole in his hand. One good swing, and he could put a stop to the madness. No, that's ridiculous. He shakes his head, clearing the impulse from his mind. The gastrointestinal distress will pass soon, and they will be able to continue the trip like they planned. But it doesn't pass. Nothing passes, but the gas itself. The blonde man asks if they can stop for water before they've even been hiking for an hour. He isn't feeling very well, he explains. He woke up dizzy and nauseated, disoriented from lying there all night, breathing in the fumes. 
The dark-haired man wants to say something to retort that he too was suffering all night, but he doesn't. He just lets his friend stop to drink some water and they proceed with the hike. Gone is the magic of the previous day, the time before the cursed berries. The men can no longer smell the wildflowers, the crisp mountain air. There are no wild animals to be found, not a single ground squirrel or little bird. Up ahead on the trail, the dark-haired man catches the barest glimpse of a tail vanishing into the brush as a mountain lion runs the other way. Is it fleeing from them? From the stench? He wouldn't blame the beast if it was. They have five more days of this planned and he can feel his resolve beginning to fade. Maybe he can turn back, ask to cut the trip short now, but why should he have to suffer just because his friend made a mistake identifying a wild berry? It isn't fair. If he could just get a moment to think without the incessant farting, if he could just have one second of peace, maybe he could come up with a solution. But no respite comes. If anything, it only seems to get worse. The smell burns his nostrils, the sound rings in his ears. The blonde man tries to speak over it, to clear the air with pleasant conversation, but the dark-haired man brushes him off with grunts and shrugs. His eyes sting and water, he chokes on the stench. He knows in his heart that he can't take much more of this. When the men make camp for the night again, the dark-haired man's thoughts turn dark. He could just leave in the dead of night while his friend is sleeping, rush off into the wilderness and abandon his companion there freeing himself from the farts. He tries to justify it to himself. They both have the survival skills to make it. He'll be fine. His thoughts of leaving his friend alone in the woods are interrupted by the sound of chewing. Is there any animal nearby? No, surely no animal would approach given the smell. He takes a look in the blonde man's tent and finds his friend eating another handful of those same brown berries. The dark-haired man flies into a rage, unable to contain his fury. How could he do this? How could he eat more of them after what happened the first time? Doesn't he understand what this is doing to him, what it's doing to the both of them? How could he be so selfish? The blonde man insists that it's fine, that the farting can't possibly be related to the berries, because manzanitas don't cause that sort of thing. At this, something in the dark-haired man snaps. He can't take it anymore. He turns away from the tent, throwing up his hands and telling the blonde man to find his own way back. They'll split up from here. The blonde man emerges from his tent, begging his friend not to cast him out. He's certain the farting will stop any day now. At this, it seems to grow louder, more potent. The dark-haired man spots a large rock by the campfire, small enough to hold in his hand, hefty enough to do some real damage. He picks it up and turns to meet his friend. Without thinking, he swings the rock at the blonde man's head. For the first time in days, the sound of farts goes silent. The air smells sweet, like flowers, leaves, and campfire smoke. He did what he had to do. The dark-haired man lets out a sigh of relief, the rock falling from his hand. He glances at the rock on the ground, at the blood dripping down its surface, and realizes the full weight of what he has just done. He packs up the campsite as quickly as he can, douses the fire, and dumps the body over the edge of a nearby cliff. Over the next few days, he hikes back the way he and his friend came, noticing in spite of his gnawing guilt that the walk really is so much better without those damned farts. On the way, he passes that bush, that horrible bush, weighed down by the fruit that destroyed his spring break trip, that destroyed his friend's life. He opens his backpack, tearing a page from one of his books and grabbing a pen. He scribbles a warning, no matter what, do not eat these berries, and affixes it to the bush. He can only hope that the next person to stumble on this shrub will see the note and heed its warning. If they don't, they might meet a similar fate. Days later, the park rangers discover the blonde man's body and declare the death an accident caused when the man fell over the side of the cliff. Some of them suspect foul play, but are unable to find any evidence. All they can find is a strange note on an unidentified shrub and the faintest smell of something foul, like rotten eggs. The two doomed hikers had no way of knowing this, but the fruit they foraged was not from the Manzanita family. It was from a plant known as SCP-4032, SCP-4032 is a wide, deciduous shrub characterized by a rounded crown and wider base. It produces a distinct, small, round brown fruit that has been designated SCP-4032-1. Whenever any animal or human consumes an instance of SCP-4032-1, this meal will result in intense gastrointestinal distress. I will try to describe this as delicately as I possibly can, but as I have learned over the years in my line of work, the truth is rarely delicate or polite. 
one hour following the consumption of an SCP-4032-1 instance, the person or animal will begin to emit an excessive amount of flatulence, consisting of elevated hydrogen sulfide levels and a small but detectable amount of methane gas. Perhaps you are familiar with an old rhyming song about the wonders of beans, the magical fruit. These berries function quite similarly. The more one eats, the more one does, in fact, for want of a better word, toot. However, unlike the second part of the bean-based rhyme, these fruits do not cause their unfortunate consumers to feel better, nor should they be eaten at every or any meal. The Foundation first discovered SCP-4032 on April 2, 2018, after a man named Anthony Green happened upon the plant in the foothills of Northern California. Hungry enough to forget his better judgment, Anthony ate some of the fruit and became immediately concerned for his physical well-being as SCP-4032's effects began to take hold. Fearing he had unknowingly consumed a poisonous plant, he made a distress call to the local search and rescue team. This call was intercepted by Foundation operatives, who swiftly arrived at the scene to bring both Anthony and the plant itself into custody. The affected individual will continue to produce this flatulence until they have expired. Both starvation and dehydration have no impact on the flatulence, and no identifiable source of the gaseous output has been detected via endoscopy. If an affected individual finds themselves in an area without adequate ventilation, they will gradually begin to experience symptoms brought on by hydrogen sulfide poisoning, including but not limited to conjunctivitis, respiratory irritation and coughing, loss of smell, and eventually pulmonary edema and death. Shortly following SCP-4032's discovery, Dr. Logari began conducting a thorough observation of Anthony Green, referred to as D-14478 for the purposes of official documentation, as he suffered from the effects of consuming SCP-4032-1. First, he was brought in for observation and placed in cell 14B on the outside of Site 88. Dr. Logari noted copious amounts of flatulence being emitted by the subject with high levels of hydrogen sulfide and methane. Five hours later, the subject was complaining about gas buildup in his cell and the interior venting hood was activated. Three hours and over 50 complaints later, the maintenance staff deactivated the interior venting hood and opened exterior windows. In an attempt to quell some of the relentless flatulence, D-14478 was placed on an intravenous diet. After two days on the intravenous diet and no changes to the subject's gas emissions, medical staff conducted an endoscopy, which revealed that the colon was clear and there were no visible signs of rectal gas. The following day, a staff meeting was held in order to discuss the impact of D-14478's condition on the quality of life at the facility. Both residents and researchers alike had complained about the persistent smell, which they were unable to escape, and was permeating the air outside as well as throughout the interior of the building. Several options were proposed, including relocation, treatment, and failing all else, termination of the subject. A resolution was passed to house D-14478 in an outdoor facility until proper filtering equipment could be installed. A little over a week later, Foundation agents intercepted reports from nearby environmental watch groups concerning an increase in airborne pollution in the central Alabama area around Site-88. With D-14478's condition threatening not only the morale at Site-88, but the environment itself, an additional resolution was passed in order to transfer D-14478 into an experimental air filtering cell. The cell had not yet passed a safety inspection, but those with objections were overruled by the vote of the majority. The following day, subject D-14478 was found dead in his cell. An investigation into the cause of death determined that the primary filter was improperly constructed, and both it and its associated sensor had malfunctioned. There was one silver lining to this unfortunate incident, however. The effects of SCP-4032-1 mercifully ceased following the subject's death. The post-mortem report was filed with the Ethics Committee, and Dr. Logari was placed on temporary administrative leave. Meanwhile, a large order of scented candles was placed by the staff of Site-88, and soon, the unpleasant odor was replaced with the smells of lavender, vanilla, sugar, and pine. In Dr. Logari's absence, Dr. Carlisle was appointed to the position of lead researcher on SCP-4032. Following the approval of the Ethics Committee, Dr. Carlisle began conducting a series of animal tests using SCP-4032. The first test subject selected was the Araucanian herring. An instance of SCP-4032-1 was crushed and added to a mix of coat pods and krill, which were then fed to a small school of herring. Fifteen minutes after the consumption of SCP-4032-1, the herring's usual flattest production increased dramatically. 
This caused great distress to the school of fish, as this species ordinarily uses flatulence as a means of communication. Samples of the flatus were taken and analyzed, and were found to contain hydrogen sulfide and methane, though the levels of both were lower than they had been in human subjects. Three hours after their initial feeding, the herring were euthanized and taken for autopsy and chemical analysis. There was no post-mortem evidence found of SCP-4032-1's effects. Next, a flock of chickens was selected for testing. They were offered a handful of SCP-4032-1 directly, which they refused to taste. The fruit was then crushed and added to chicken feed, which was fed to the chickens with great success. Two hours after eating SCP-4032-1, all of the chickens began to emit gas containing low levels of methane and hydrogen sulfide. The chickens were promptly euthanized and taken for analysis, where an autopsy determined that the bird's short intestinal tracts were distended. This marked the first recorded visible sign of the fruit's impact on a test subject. The next animal selected for testing were brown-throated three-toed sloths. This particular species was chosen due to its lack of flatulence, as these sloths tend to absorb flatus and release it through their lungs, rather than rectally. The fruit was offered directly at first, but the sloths rejected it. The fruit was then crushed and ground with a mixture of tree leaves and fed to the sloths. Whatever happened next has been redacted from the official Foundation file, but it was disturbing enough to bring a grinding halt to any and all future testing of SCP-4032 on large mammals. Any potential animal experiments involving SCP-4032 must be approved by the Ethics Committee in order to prevent another, quote, sloth incident. SCP-4032 has been contained in a cordoned off portion of the research gardens at Site 67, which consists of the area around SCP-4032's original location. This land was purchased by the Foundation, and a research facility disguised as a personal estate was constructed there. SCP-4032, along with several other anomalous plants, is kept in the garden portion of the site. All instances of SCP-4032-1 are to be gathered from the ground on a daily basis and incinerated on site. Any employees found to be using the berries for unapproved personal purposes will be suspended or terminated from their positions. If any animals wander onto the grounds and consume the berries, they must be captured and euthanized, and their bodies incinerated. Though there is currently only one known specimen of SCP-4032, the Foundation has a contingency plan in place should any additional specimens be discovered. If this happens, Mobile Task Force Alpha-67 Weed Whackers will be dispatched to the specimen's location, where they will uproot it and bring it back to Site-67 to be contained. Any humans that consume an instance of SCP-4032-1 must be contained in holding cells B1 through B5 along the outer perimeter of Site-67. Each of these cells is equipped with three air filters containing Thiobacillus thioparis, chemolithoatrophic sulfur oxidizing bacteria embedded in a mixture of peat and polyurethane. Each filter also contains sensors intended to detect hydrogen sulfide and methane. When the sensors are activated, members of Mobile Task Force Alpha-13 odor eaters are dispatched to escort the affected individual outside until the filters in their cell can be repaired. Currently, the Foundation does not believe there to be any additional specimens of SCP-4032 in the wild. However, there is no way to be certain of this, due to the plant's relatively unassuming appearance and the lack of any information on its origins. It is entirely possible that there are more of these shrubs just waiting to be discovered by an unfortunate hiker wandering off the beaten path. So if you find yourself out in nature with an empty stomach, make sure that you have accurately identified any of the wild plants you consume. If you don't, you may be met with a fate that is silent, but deadly. A hand clasps around your throat, cutting off your scream. You try to move, but the hands of the two people restraining you won't allow it. You're being dragged towards something monstrous and terrible in the corner, something hiding under a white sheet. You will die a painful death, and the ones dragging you towards it are your parents. As the dewy green of summer begins to fade, the grass drying, the air chilling, and the leaves turning shades of fire and gold, most children's thoughts turn to Halloween. Visions of fun-sized candy bars spilling out of plastic pumpkin buckets, of ill-fitting rubber masks that smell like the back of a party store, of candy apples and ringing doorbells, and terrifying their friends with scary stories. It's a magical time where anyone can be anything, and candy is free to anyone who asks the question, trick or treat. But as those children get older, Halloween begins to lose its magic. 
They age out of trick-or-treating and no longer find themselves amused by carving pumpkins or screaming at plastic skeletons in their neighbors' yards. They age out of the sense of wonder and they find that their neighbors aren't as keen to give away candy to someone with a driver's license. But some children hold on to that love of Halloween into adulthood, transforming the childlike joy into an appreciation for parties, more mature scary stories with blood and guts aplenty, and yes, themed baked goods. You're never too old to enjoy a Rice Krispie treat shaped like a ghost. At least, that's what the sorority girl planning the biggest Halloween party on campus at her small university believes. She has festooned the sorority house with fake cobwebs and ghosts made of hanging bits of gauze, with plastic spiders and zombies made of rubber. There are the classic plastic skeletons, the jack-o'-lanterns filled with battery-powered candles, no fire hazards here, and of course, a huge cauldron filled with punch and dry ice. Smoke billows over the sides of the cauldron as she stirs the garish but inviting lime green liquid inside. She has the lights rigged up to give the place an eerie red glow and has the perfect playlist of Halloween music put together. Now she just needs to wait for the guests to arrive. At first, she worries that no one will come. The first few people to ring the doorbell turn out to be trick-or-treaters, and she sends them away with a fistful of candy bars and a smile. But each time, she is secretly a little disappointed. About an hour after she finished setting up, guests begin to arrive. Even if not everyone at school is into Halloween, there are very few college students who will pass up an opportunity for a party. And before long, the house is filled with dancing pirates, vampires sipping cups of punch, werewolves digging into bowls of chips, and cats flirting with dogs. Everyone is dressed up and embracing the Halloween spirit, and the girl couldn't be happier. She's been so busy playing hostess that she almost forgot to dress up, but she takes a moment to steal away upstairs and put on her costume. A classic witch costume, black dress, black shoes, and complete with a pointy black hat. As she heads back downstairs, dressed up and ready to have a great time, she takes a moment to survey the crowd. It seems like everyone on campus decided to come to her party. The girl is going to get herself a drink and settle in to enjoy her party when she hears the doorbell ring. Someone else is here. But as she walks toward the door, she pauses for a moment, an icy chill of dread washing over her. The party guests know that they can just walk right in. That's what they've been doing all night. And it's almost midnight, much too late for trick-or-treaters. Who's out there? She peers through the peephole and sees someone in a rudimentary ghost costume, covered head to toe, in a white sheet. Even if it's someone she knows, she wouldn't be able to recognize them like that. She can't explain why, but she has a bad feeling about this person. She doesn't want to be rude, but she wants to let them in even less. She turns back away from the door, ready to let the stranger stand on her porch all night, and finds all of her party guests standing still, staring at the door, staring at her. She tries to laugh it off and get everyone to return to the party, but the energy in the room has shifted. Everyone's focus is on the person on the other side of the door. She walks to the punch bowl, pours herself a cup, and encourages everyone to get back to the party. Instead, a pirate and a mermaid walk to the door, turning the knob even as the girl asks them to stop. They open it, letting the stranger in the sheet inside. The figure glides through the door, moving in a way that seems just a little bit off. The girl is struck with a feeling that she hasn't experienced since she was a little girl. The sense, deep down in her gut, that something could really be a monster. Whatever she does, she can't let the thing in the sheet get close to her. She doesn't know what will happen, but the thought of it turns her stomach with a primal sense of danger. She starts to run, but a girl dressed as a tiger grabs hold of her arm, wrenching her back. The girl struggles to free herself but a man in a vampire costume grabs her other arm, gripping her so tight his knuckles turn white and she can feel the flesh bruising. She pleads with her friends, trying to get them to see reason and release her, but they won't budge. The tiger girl apologizes through tears, but won't let go. As the girl thrashes, pulling so hard to free herself that she worries her arm will break, the figure in the sheet inches closer and closer. She shouts at it, demanding to know who it is, what it wants, why it's hiding behind that sheet. But it doesn't say a word doesn't give a clue. There's no expression to read, only the blank white fabric. When it reaches the girl, her feet fly out from under her, and she collapses to the ground, yanked forward by an unseen force. Something is pulling her under the sheet. She claws at the floor, trying to drag herself away from the force, but she can't. The party guests watch, helpless, as their hostess disappears under the sheet, until the only thing left is her writhing silhouette and her screams. 
Then, the screams go quiet. Nothing left of the girl but her witch's hat lying on the floor. The figure gathers its sheet around itself and calmly walks out of the party. Those unfortunate guests watch their even more unfortunate friend encounter the creature known as SCP-6096. SCP-6096 is a humanoid entity that spends all of its time hidden beneath a large cotton sheet. A vague sense of its shape can be garnered by observing the entity, but its body is hidden at all times, preventing a complete physical description from being recorded. However, Foundation researchers have determined via a cursory examination that the entity is 1.55 meters tall and that it weighs approximately 48 kilograms. The sheet itself is larger than SCP-6096's body, trailing on the ground behind it by at least a meter whenever the entity moves. All attempts to remove the sheet in order to get a proper look at the thing have been unsuccessful. One of the most unusual properties of SCP-6096 is that it cannot be harmed. I don't mean that it is impervious to damage, but rather that any living being that attempts to engage in a behavior that would harm the entity finds themselves unable to do so. This includes, but is presumably not limited to, actions such as attempting to attack SCP-6096, attempting to order others to attack SCP-6096, attempting to trick others into attacking SCP-6096 without their knowledge, laying a trap for SCP-6096, ordering others to lay a trap for SCP-6096, creating an autonomous device that would harm SCP-6096, attempting to leave SCP-6096 unsupervised and in harm's way, and attempting to remove SCP-6096's sheet. Most of the time, SCP-6096's behavior is described as peaceful and docile. As long as there is no danger present, it allows itself to be led into containment and remains there with seemingly no objections. However, every so often, the entity becomes active and will attempt to leave its location. It does so at a steady pace with single-minded persistence as it pursues one specific target at a time. It is uncertain how the entity chooses a target, but so far, it has always been a seemingly random human being somewhere on Earth. Not only does SCP-6096 know exactly who its target is, but anyone who observes the entity during an active period finds that they, too, know who it is seeking out. In addition to this anomalous effect, the person will also find themselves compelled to help SCP-6096 reach its intended target. These targets appear to be the only individuals unaffected by SCP-6096's anti-harm properties. A person that the entity has selected will, in fact, be able to harm it. However, none have managed to successfully do so, mainly due to the protective influence of the other humans caught in the creature's anomalous thrall. But what happens when SCP-6096 reaches its target? Research into this has been largely inconclusive, but a few facts are certain. SCP-6096 will pull the person underneath its sheet until they have disappeared from view. If the victim is conscious, they can be heard fighting, struggling, and screaming in unimaginable agony for up to 40 minutes. Then they go silent and are never seen again. Once its chosen victim has disappeared, SCP-6096 becomes docile and largely immobile again and can be led back to containment. Whatever happens to its targets under that sheet, it is definitely not anything good. SCP-6096 was discovered by the SCP Foundation on September 12, 2018, when police were called to the home of the Malian family in the town of Durham, New Mexico. Samuel and Amanda Malian greeted the officers in a state of distress, claiming that a person wearing a sheet had come into their home and somehow caused their 16-year-old son Desmond to disappear. Authorities spotted SCP-6096 inside the home and planned to remove the sheet in order to interrogate and detain the suspect, but found themselves unable to take another step closer to the thing. Terrified by their inexplicable encounter, they submitted an incident report to their supervisor, who passed it up through the chain of command in the regional government until it landed in the hands of the SCP Foundation. Alongside the police report, the Foundation was able to access security camera footage from the Malian family home. A transcription of the video's contents is included in the official Foundation files. I'll do my best to summarize its events. The home security footage depicts the Malian family sitting on their living room couch, facing the television. Samuel and Amanda watch a program on TV as Desmond idly scrolls through his phone. Outside, a car can be heard pulling into the driveway. Though the driver's identity has not been confirmed, this is believed to be a local taxi driver named Drake Ellen, dropping SCP-6096 off at the Malian's door. 
A moment later, Samuel draws his wife's attention toward a window. At first, the two are surprised but amused, assuming that SCP-6096 is some sort of errant Halloween decoration. However, they become increasingly disturbed as the sheet-covered figure approaches their door and begins to knock, so softly it is nearly inaudible. As Samuel gets up to answer the door, Amanda grabs her son's arm, holding him in an increasingly tight grip and refusing to let him pull away. Unable to stop herself, no matter how upset she becomes, she holds Desmond still as her husband lets SCP-6096 into the house. It glides across the floor toward Desmond, who struggles to break free from his crying mother's grasp. Amanda can be heard reassuring him, saying, You just stay still, honey. You just close your eyes. It won't hurt if you just close your eyes. I love you. Desmond struggles harder, but finds himself unable to break his mother's hold. He kicks his legs, knocking his phone to the ground as the sheet-covered entity draws closer and closer. He begs his mother to let him go, but she doesn't budge. His father, through tears, says, Just stay still, son. Just stay still. It won't hurt for long. It can't hurt for long. Stay strong. Stay strong for me. Starting with his feet, the entity begins to cover Desmond with its sheet, pulling him out of sight. Amanda and Samuel watch in wordless, open-mouthed horror, silent screams stretching their faces into masks of terror and grief. Desmond can be heard screaming, thrashing violently beneath the sheet, though what exactly is happening to him under there cannot be seen. This continues for the next 36 minutes, until Desmond has completely vanished. At this point, SCP-6096 wraps itself in its sheet and sits down on the floor, watching the television without a care in the world. Amanda and Samuel, on the other hand, find themselves able to move on their own again and must reckon with what they just saw, what they just participated in. Samuel collapses to the ground, curling up in the fetal position and rocking back and forth in shock. Amanda stumbles backward, keeping her eyes locked on SCP-6096 and dials 911 on her cell phone. They stay right there until the police arrive. At this point, the video log cuts out. After the SCP Foundation was notified of the incident at the Malian family home, Foundation officers administered Class A amnestics to Amanda and Samuel, as well as to all responding officers who encountered SCP-6096. It is uncertain how long SCP-6096 was operating before this incident, or where it could have come from. SCP-6096's containment is strictly under the jurisdiction of Mobile Task Force Zeta-29, Blood Brothers. The anomaly is kept in a standard humanoid containment chamber, located on the grounds of Site-19, where it is monitored by on-site personnel via video and audio recording devices. If any changes in its behavior are noted, they are to be promptly logged and reported. Unlike most anomalies at the SCP Foundation, SCP-6096 is permitted to leave its containment area whenever it chooses. Whenever it does choose to leave, SCP-6096 must be escorted to its intended destination by MTF Zeta-29. Task Force members may use whatever method of transportation is most convenient at the time. While this group is escorting the entity, a secondary team will travel to its intended target, dosing them with a high-grade tranquilizer to render them unconscious. Once the entity has disposed of its target, it will be accompanied back to its containment chamber. There are no easy jobs at the SCP Foundation, aside from the lucky few who get to spend their days playing with SCP-999. But staff assigned to the containment, if you can even call it that, of SCP-6096 report some of the lowest morale levels at the organization. A welcome notice from Charlie Simansky, commander of Mobile Task Force Zeta-29, Blood Brothers, is included in the official file, presumably for task force member eyes only. Nevertheless, I feel it is important that I share the contents of this note with all of you, as they provide a valuable look into the perspective of the members of this unfortunate task force. It reads, And there you have it. Welcome to Mobile Task Force Zeta-29. No need to worry about professionalism down here. The higher-ups couldn't demote me if they wanted to. Apparently, my presence as the head of SCP-6096 containment is beneficial enough to it that me being reassigned would count as harming it. Lucky me. You're probably wondering how we can be shameless enough to say we have this thing under containment. It comes and goes whenever it feels like it, and if it ever decided it didn't want to come back to its containment cell, we have literally no way of forcing it. And yeah, you're probably also thinking that calling that room a containment chamber instead of a hotel room is just as shameful. To that I say, you're absolutely right. There's nothing we can do against SCP-6096. Feel free to self-medicate until you're able to accept that. Don't hold back. 
you're going to become very familiar with that feeling of gnawing guilt. I know I did, the first time I had to hold the door to a maternity ward open for this thing. The idea of containing SCP-6096 is a bad joke. We all decided a long time ago that the only way out of this nightmare is liquidation, decommissioning, neutralization, whatever you want to call it. But that's no walk in the park either. I've stood in that chamber for hours, gun pointed at 6096's head, screaming at my finger just to tighten slightly. Didn't work. You can't harm SCP-6096, no matter how much you want to. You can't even try to start a Rube Goldberg kind of thing to eventually harm SCP-6096. It's just a fact of the world, maybe a semi-o-hazard or whatever it's called. The way I see it then, there are three main ways out of this nightmare. One, another organization, maybe the GOC, takes a shot at it without realizing what they're dealing with. Maybe they think we're transporting something much more dangerous. Maybe they think we're in over our heads with it, and they take it out with a drone or something, blow the thing to hell while we're transporting it. A bomb would kill it easy, I think. It feels weak. This would only work so long as the GOC thinks they're bombing something else entirely. If they knew it was SCP-6096, they'd just be contained too. Two, an AIC deals with it. I don't know if an artificial intelligence is immune to SCP-6096's effects, but the fact that it won't let me tell one of them about it gives me hope. Maybe one day one of those computers gets a mission, and maybe that mission, by complete coincidence, happens to lead them over to this file. Then they use their superior intelligence to set things up so 6096 runs into an accident out of the blue. 3. A target gets lucky. Maybe 6096 goes after a gun nut, and the poor guy gets a lucky shot in before we can hold him down. This almost happened once, but Lopez took the bullet. Poor guy bled out while we were holding the target down for 6096. Maybe it'll happen again? Go better? Maybe, maybe, maybe. Let's be honest. These scenarios aren't scenarios, they're fantasies. The odds of any of these things happening on their own are tiny, minuscule. The only thing that can really do 6096 in, far as I can see, is sheer coincidence. All we can do is wait and hope. Hope for one of us to make a genuine mistake that gets the right dominoes falling. But I wouldn't hold your breath. After all, we're so good at what we do. Of all the anomalies I have studied, SCP-6096 is one that troubles me more than almost any other. I have lost sleep watching the Malian family security footage again and again, each time shocked by the sight of two tearful parents helping a sheet-covered stranger steal their only son, doing who knows what to him in the process. No matter how hard I try, I cannot discern SCP-6096's motives, its origins, or even what its real face looks like. Perhaps it doesn't have one. Perhaps there's nothing under that sheet. The hardest part is knowing that I will likely never know. That uncertainty is so much worse than any of the horrible truths I have uncovered in my years of studying the anomalies that hide in the shadows of our world. Though I may never uncover the answers to the mystery of SCP-6096, there is one thing I know for certain. I will never be able to relax around Halloween. That walking bedsheet might be someone who ran out of time to plan a proper costume and just grab the first thing they could find. Or it could be a faceless horror walking with the relaxed gait of the incomprehensibly powerful on its way to claim another unfortunate soul. Check out the Dr. Bob Patreon and become a junior researcher today. Now go and watch another entry from the files of Dr. Bob, like SCP-5056, The Constant Companions.